Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons, people and Nephilim. We've got an excellent show for you tonight, because here at the Westmarks Workshop, we are the Bitchin' Kitchen. I want to say that this show is tubular to the max. Like, we are five out of five Nephilims. Our fans have said it, and we agree. And so here we are with another episode oops, of the Westmarks Workshop. Yeah, I almost, I almost did that one, and then I screwed up on the music. I went to go and turn it. I went to go and turn it down, and then blasted it up. Turn it down, blast it up. Uh huh. We are professional grade. We're also farmers. <laughs> we are farmers. That's right. And I got my boy here, by the way. And then now the jingle played in your head. Pikachu. <laughs> that that's the weirdest looking treasure goblin I've ever seen. <laughs> You guys haven't heard? These are coming in patch uh, 1.1 with is, PvP. <laughs> is that is that the Gilded Baron? I've never seen one up close. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what it looks like. It's a little a little yellow. You got to get real close for the details. Hmm, that that must what it be. I have to I have to up the resolution. Mm -hmm. Got to tighten up the graphics. Tighten up. So what's going on, man? I missed your last uh, show that we had. Yeah, yeah. I guess we could probably jump in to kind of like the week in gaming on that one. And my week's month, month in gaming, has been, uh, I guess, a bit uh, eventful but boring. I, as, uh, you know, as you went through and said, last week I was uh, moving. And so I, well, or not last week, last episode. Um, still haven't gotten the hang of the, you know, like, know. It's, it's two weeks in between episodes. It feels, it's, doesn't it's even tough. feel that long. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was in the process of going through and packing. I was actually, I was hanging out in chat because I just had it playing on my computer while I was, uh, tearing apart my room and throwing it all into little tiny boxes and going through and getting ready. And then this past week I've spent, uh, just kind of like unpacking everything. It takes, you know, like two weeks to pack and two weeks to unpack. So got, I got the, the bookshelves and stuff like that behind me. I've got, uh, if you can see it, I got El Druin hanging out there in the background. And, well, I'm still getting used to everything. Don't don't worry about that guy right there. I, I'll get the hang of this eventually. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm all set. I moved in. I can't can't wait. I guess I should probably I could go even further back since it has been like a month. I didn't yeah. get to do like my season ten recap. Um, I, I did, I did manage to go through and get Guardian. Uh, the last couple of things that I was waiting on was the, um, what you call it? The Conquest. I can't believe I forgot mm -hmm. that. It's been a while since I did this. Uh, it's alright. <laughs> you'll, you'll find it. You'll find the pocket. I'll get, I'll get back in there. But yeah, I was just waiting on having to go through and do, um, uh, Conquest. And so I managed to go through and get a couple knocked out and got Guardian a couple days before the season ended and... Then went back to uh, moving prep, playing around with the uh, the necro for a little bit, and I did some streams here and there. And uh, but I haven't really done much uh, these past three weeks. I was just uh, you know having to go through, moving to uh, moving to a new place, getting everything set up, uh, looking for uh, looking for work, new job, and all that. Got some, got a couple a couple uh, good things coming up. Hopefully, uh, I will hear by the end of the week. And as I'm sure now that season 11 is starting, I will probably get a phone call tomorrow and have to start on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> as it's, these things usually go. As these things usually do, but I guess in the grand scheme of things, I should probably be thankful. Uh, so thankful for that one. Aren't uh, you thankful? I am thankful. Uh, but yeah, just uh, getting in there and getting ready for tomorrow. It's, it's here. It's finally here. Finally here, right? Uh. Although, you know what's funny is it's, it felt like when it was announced that it would be about a, between season 10 and season 11, like, man, that's so much time. But now as it's drawn closer and I'm realizing all the things I really should do before the season starts, it feels like no time at all. Like, one mm -hmm. week ago feels like it was yesterday. Oh, yeah. It, it feel, It's like, yeah, it's... It, simultaneously feels like it's been forever and yet you know it's like well shit you know the last time i was on the show was literally like a month ago and it does it feels like yesterday all right it feels like you've had the necromancer forever right right crazy times crazy times uh, but you good sir 
How have how have you been? What have you been up to? So I've been doing a decent amount of mixing both real life stuff and uh, game stuff because, like I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of prep to get ready before you start to know life. At the beginning of a season, you got to make sure all the bills are paid and anyone that might need you for any sort of living assistance life take care of them so they don't bug you Mm -hmm. uh so i'm trying to nail all those things down like you know clean the apartment just a little bit more so i can neglect it for about a month um get all the groceries in in order and you know take care of any sort of work or work items that are needed from me writing pieces videos like getting content out the door was really important Mm -hmm. before the season started um so it's it's been a really busy last two weeks for me, just trying to pump out as much as I can with, you know, guides, builds, um, trying to make sure that, like, the stream is all set up so I don't have to be messing with that while I'm trying to grind. And it's, it's so many I's to dot and T's to cross. But, I mean, at the same time, I also love it. Like, this feels like Christmas every time a, a new season rolls around because, you know, you're starting to get those restless nights. You wake up, you're like, oh, there was a rainbow goblet. Did we get it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so just so many... Uh, so many hype moments as you start to re- reflect on the past seasons and how we'll play better than we did last time and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. How you can improve upon it. Exactly. You want you always want your newest opener to be better than your previous openers. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things to mention, though, and you were asking me a little bit about it before we started the show, I had a fun weekend this past weekend away from uh, Massachusetts. Uh, my first roommate when I moved up here... Uh, he's getting married in August, so I'll actually miss one of the early weekends of the season, which is a little bit of a bummer, but, you know, for a fun occasion. Um, we did his bachelor party weekend this past weekend, and all the guys involved in the uh, groom's man's party, whatever it's called, whatever the proper terms are for that, uh, we're all nerds. So the whole weekend was just about nerding out together, broing out nerd style. So we had a bunch of, like, awesome drinks and stuff, of course, you know. Cracking open some cold ones with the boys. With the boys. <laughs> and uh, we did a whole bunch of, like, just games. Like, when I rolled up, they were playing Bang, which is, like, some oh, card yeah. game. Mm-hmm. You've probably heard of it. Um, I, I've played... Um, I haven't played Bang itself, but I've played a version of it. Like, some, it was like one of the, the mo- all-time most popular arcade mods in StarCraft II. Mm-hmm. It was just the card game. Interesting. Yeah, and then also I think it was like Romance of the Seven Kingdoms. It was like a Chinese version of it. That kind of sounds familiar. Maybe I've heard of it. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, so um, they were playing that, and then we got the group together to go and just like, you know, it was a weekend of eating good food and playing a bunch of games. So we went and got some... Like, amazing Korean barbecue, which was the first time I did that. And after, you know, all our California, Irvine people talking about it all day, every day, it was nice to finally actually see what the whole fuss was about. And, man, it, it lived it, up to the hype. That, that was going to be my question. Did it live up? Because that's the oh. important question. Well, it's weird because you're there cooking your own food. So you're like, you know, I'm, I'm hungry. I just want to eat. I don't want to mm. work. But it's all the more rewarding when that crispy duck that hot pot of tomato goodness with the spicy sauce in it just you know rolls off into your plate you got them udon noodles dripping all sorts of lovely stuff like ah it was just it was good it was really good so you even you even have to cook your own food because see i've still i've never experienced that so i have no idea yeah it's like your table just has a nice grill on it not a grill a grill (laughs) and it's very hot it's a hot grill Oh, and really? You throw down the slabs of food. Yeah, they just bring you, like, raw meat. They bring you uh, vegetables, raw vegetables, um, like anything, like onions, anything you think you could grill. You just, you know, you order it, and then they bring it out to you, and you cook it. And the, the, since the grill's so hot, everything is prepared, like, relatively quickly. Okay. And we went to one that was, like, all you could eat. So, Ooh, you know, it was eight of better. us. And we just went ham on it. We I think we got one of everything on the menu the first round, and then, like, after that, we mm-hmm. snacked favorites. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, cuz you want to experience a little taste of everything and see what uh see what you like. So you you're better you're better prepared for going to BlizzCon. Oh yes, yeah. We'll we'll be like master experts for the BlizzCon adventure. All right. I'm looking forward to it. There's uh the new place that I moved to, there's a a faux place here that I want to go through and try out cuz that's another one that I've heard a lot of people talk about. Nice. Yeah, man. Broaden those horizons. Yep. 
Um, and funny that you mentioned BlizzCon too, because this uh, weekend sort of felt like a mini BlizzCon. We also played Code Names, which I was like, "Hey, this, oh. this, this feels like BlizzCon." <laughs> it's a fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! And it was just as horrifically bad as I remember it from BlizzCon too. Like I thought I was giving great clues on my turn, and they just went so left field. <laughs> I was, you know, I was trying to keep that poker face. You're not supposed to give anything away, but yep. in reality, I was just face palming. I actually had my hand, just like, why, dear God, why, these people, please? <laughs> it's not Swedish fish. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is killing me. And and then kind of like going along with the BlizzCon. Redu Redux. Uh, we also did an escape room, which was mm -hmm. something I tweeted about, and you were, I was alluding to you asking me about that. And this one was really interesting because it was different from the two that we did, in that um, it had similar elements. Like you know, there's the same like you know, there's a TV, and sometimes it gives you clues and <laughs> multiple rooms and things like that. But this one, it, the theme was Alcatraz, right? And so you're prisoners in Alcatraz trying to escape, but not only do you have to escape the room. You also have to escape your cuffs because you're actually prisoners. So they handcuffed us together and you're trying to like find pieces of the puzzle and stuff and everyone like gets into the room and this guy wants to run this way, this guy wants to run that way, but you're like, wait guys, we have to organize. Like we're all cuffed together, so people like tripping over each other and stuff. That's pretty fun just to like have a, a double escape, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was interesting because again, like everyone was very nerdy, so everyone had their own strengths and weaknesses. Like there was a maze thing that someone was really good at doing mazes, so they did that. There was a cipher, someone was really good at like decoding stuff, so they did that. I was really good at just like putting the logic of how things are supposed to go together, so I was mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, this is like a, a touch puzzle here. We need to figure out the order that we touch these things, and then kind of like delegating. All right, you guys figure out what's in that corner. You organize the clues that we've used over here. So just having like the past escape room experience it's definitely helpful for some of the people that were brand new. They were just like, I have something. It, it, it says words. What do I do? Mm -hmm. And just being able to know, like, okay, if you can organize a little bit, you can definitely decrease your time spent in the room. Yeah. I, I, I had also done a puzzle room this weekend, but it went very badly. Oh. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was, it was a bunch of people that had never done a puzzle room before, and so everyone just kept looking at me to try and solve all the puzzles. It's like, we, we have to do multiple things at once. We can't all just focus on the same thing. Uh, it was like an Alice in Wonderland themed, and the guy that put it together, and it's like, I had, I had seen like the Disney movie, but never read the book, you know? And so there were a lot of things that were in it that if you were familiar with the, like really familiar with the story, you could have skipped puzzles. Oh, uh, because you already knew like how it would go. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Especially like, especially like the the very like the very last puzzle. Like you didn't even have to do anything in the final room, um, if you were familiar. If you were like familiar with the story, you could sk like skip the entire third room. <laughs> oh wow! And that that's like one of those things because when we were there, I think we still did it like an hour and six minutes. But uh, like the best time on it was, I think, like it was. It was a whole bunch. It was like the like the top ten list was like I think the second place to like the tenth place was from like fifty three minutes to like you know fifty nine and a half, and mm -hmm. then the top one was like thirty six minutes. Oh wow! Yeah, that's like a challenge riff when you just have that one guy that knows exactly what to do, and everyone else is like, I think I know what to do, but clearly I don't. This yeah. person has figured it out way ahead of everyone else. Yep, there, there, was, there was a whole bunch of like little things like that where you could, if you were familiar with certain certain aspects of the story, you could straight like skip puzzles. Craziness. Yep. That actually reminds me of the last puzzle that we had in our uh, escape room. There was a clue to figure out like signs of the Zodiac. They had this table where you had to touch certain signs all at once in order mm -hmm. to escape. And we had three of the signs out of four. And we legit just got to the point where, like, let's just brute force this. So, like, we had it. people touch three and then, you know, just, okay, not that one. Okay, not mm -hmm. that one. Okay, not that one. Hey, door open. Yep. That that was one thing that we had to do. Um, I, was, I was telling you a little bit about it before the show, but we ran into a problem. Uh, just kind of, like, one of those things. Yeah, And it, it's, like, you don't even think about it. But it's, like, there's so much thought that goes not just in behind, like, the puzzle room, but, like, the game development in general. That mm -hmm. you had to, like, peer kind of, like, through, like, a little looking glass. Because, you know, Alice in Wonderland theme. 
Uh, there's uh, riddles that you had to solve, and then the answers to the riddles are like thrown around the room, and then it corresponds to a color, and you look through the looking glass, and it'll, it looks into um, a display of numbers, and the numbers have, correspond to the color that you then use on like the lock. Uh, but two of the people in my group were too short to get to the looking glass, and then the <laughs> other person was colorblind. Whoops. Yeah, so... Like, it, that became, like, one of those difficult uh, difficult things was because they were just kind of, like, sitting there. Like, I was the one that was expected to, like, solve, like, the riddle. But then I was the only one that could actually look through the looking glass because they had to, like, solve the riddle, call out the answer into the next room for me to look through to get the number to call back to open the lock. Insanity. Yeah. And so it's just, like, some of those things that it's like, well, this this was definitely, like, a little, uh, like, an interesting experience, like, that we got, like, held up on that puzzle, you know, because of, like, little tiny things like that. Yeah, it's like, like it, mechanics. Yeah, if it, if it had been, like, just a little bit lower or some, uh, if the color arrangement had been uh, thought out a little bit better. It was, like, four, four of the colors looked exactly the same to the guy that was colorblind. And, of course, it was, like, a bunch of the numbers that we needed. That'll be uh, patched next time you go. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> but there's there's a whole bunch of uh, puzzle rooms that just opened up here in like uh, Palm Beach County, like in like the just like the last couple of months. It's like really like starting to boom up. And there's there's a horror one in downtown that is like it, it seems like it's of course got like the hour long timer, but you have it's like broken into four rooms and you have 15 minutes to solve each room oh i like that yeah because That's you're like cool trying yeah you're escaping in a uh, serial killer and he's like always 15 minutes behind you so as soon as you solve a puzzle you have to like literally like run into the next room because like when you apparently it's like when you solve it and like open the door he opens his door Mm. And so it was like running after you, and, and so it has like jump scares and stuff like that. It seems to be really intense. I I desperately want to try that one, uh, but I I need to I need to kind of get a crew together for that one. Assemble your crew. Yeah. yeah, I think you're you're you know before we turn into a puzzle room podcast. <laughs> um, I, I do coming think next week, right? <laughs> the puzzle workshop. Hey. Um, Realizing that like the popularity of escape rooms and stuff is really increasing, even just in Philly where we were, there were about five within the vicinity of each other, so we had tons of choices. And even like you know, we're talking about plans for BlizzCon to maybe do some more. And even the just the one place we went to, they've expanded to like three new puzzles and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's pretty cool to see it's really taking off. Like you know, fidget, we got fidget spinners, you got escape rooms. <laughs> yeah. What's the next big trend? And I just I have to ask. Did you intend the puzzle workshop? Oh yes. Okay. All right. Just checking. My brain's my brain's moving. Man. I've been getting <laughs> sleep. I've been, I've been I've been good. Uh huh. Uh, I, I think it, it would have it would have been good either way. Uh, maybe for the drama of the show, I should have said what? No. What? what? No. Can you just uh, you'll you'll edit this right? Oh yes, totally. Oh, uh, so yeah. give us your shocked reaction now. <gasps> oh wow, that's so cool! I didn't realize I did that. <laughs> <laughs> all right maybe we should talk about diablo i think we should because there's some exciting stuff to talk about really now yeah man what what exciting things are happening in the near future for diablo 3 good sir well this is a rare occasion like i uh mentioned on the wm workshop twitter feel free to follow it a little plug oh, i'm gonna go over there and follow it right now <laughs> oh, you, you ha oh, yeah, you definitely should. <laughs> I'm surprised you haven't yet. Weird. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the first opportunity, I want to say, that we've had a show before the night before a season starts, which usually, you know, it's a Friday that the mm -hmm. season will go live. So this season in particular is rather odd or rare, if you will, because it's starting on a Thursday night. And that, again, is to give Blizzard a little bit of opportunity to quash any bugs that may pop up with a lot of players probably coming back for the Necro and maybe holding off on playing until the season goes live. Mm -hmm. So we might see a nice influx of players and potential problems come up uh, tomorrow night. When season 11 goes live, that is right, July 20th, 5 p.m. Eastern, or five, sorry, 5 p.m. Pacific. There are going to be so many people like, how come the season didn't start yet? He <laughs> said 5 p.m. Eastern. Well, I'm sitting here. <laughs> I'm waiting. Three hours. Give it three hours. 
But yeah, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific for the Americas. Um, and by the time you hear this, the, the season might already be going, man. So, you know, get in gear, get ready. Mm-hmm. I guess it's more for the people in chat. Um, very exciting times, though, because, you know, the Necro is the brand new X Factor. It's potentially mixing up the meta in all sorts of different ways, whether it's support oh. or the, whether it's a uh, boss killer. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, if you're a fan of anything that was really going on in Season 10, you know, many of the classes did not receive any changes. If anything, a, you know, a superficial change with taking away the name of Simulacrum from one of the wizard, like, runes or something, because that's a Necro skill now. Ruined and... by immersion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is ours now. Necro. <laughs> Necro Necroed it. And it's, it's awesome, because now you can carry over any of the stuff that you were kind of getting really proficient at from S10, and... It'll still be relevant in S11, and then you mix in the awesomeness of the Necro, and you got yourself a stew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be interesting seeing how it really affects, I guess for um, solo leaderboards, not a lot has changed. Um, nope. There is the, I guess, some potential. I don't, I don't, I get... you know, we might see a little bit higher pushes this season. Uh, just because of the uh, the potential power of the the necro that it might be bringing to like the uh, the group play, yeah. Um, so higher just for getting higher higher paragon levels, higher gems. Uh, mm-hmm. But we should, I guess, see the same spread from everyone but the necro uh, when it comes to solo. Or alternatively, because so many people funnel into the necro class, if they don't decide to go alts, or you know, you might yeah. see less uh, spread because. Or at least like a weirder array of it because, mm-hmm. you know, might not be as competitive for the top 10 if, you know, all the best players are on Necro or something like that. Very true, very true. One thing that's kind of been batted around is if you're a person that likes playing supports, like you might be in high demand because there could be so many like, hey, boss killer here, hey, boss killer here, and mm-hmm. no one to support those boss killers or anything. So, yep. Definitely, if you can diversify your pool of uh, applicants, then you'll be accepted into a lot of groups. Yeah, and uh, but even just going through and playing the Necromancer, there are a couple very promising uh, support builds. There's uh, two different mm-hmm. support builds that I saw yesterday. I was going through and uh, perusing around on the, uh, the Reddits um, that were going through and having some... They were like uh, two-man, like, GR... Uh, 110 pushes. Yeah, 110 plus. Yeah, which is some uh, some pretty crazy stuff there. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of that stuff I'll still take with a grain of salt because it's like you got to check the Paragon levels and the augments and stuff. And like, all right. I mean, no, no matter what, they're doing it, right? So yeah. it's a proven duo. But, you know, when you're playing it to seasons, it's like, well, it's not going to probably go that high. But then again, who knows? Like, again, we still don't even know, like, if the best Necro build has been discovered, if the best support version has been discovered. So there's that. I feel like that's my level of excitement. Is so much is still up in the air. Everyone's trying to nail down what do I need, gear wise, skill wise. Like what should I plan for? And honestly, the best answer is you cannot plan for this. I, I feel we've talked about this on a previous episode, and I want to say that there was, there was only like two occasions where like the when when you know the the patches. Uh, had a lot more sweeping changes, and there was a lot of uh, a lot of kind of uh, chaos that was thrown into the mix. That before the season, there was like the the quote unquote top build going into it, like from the PTR, and then during the course of the season, that top build changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, Happens more often than not. I, I want to say that there were have only been like, uh, I guess not so much counting, uh, like. Some of the some of the, the the minor changed seasons, you know, like season seven to eight and eight to nine, um, or I guess not. I mean uh, nine to ten, uh, or no, there was some changes in ten. I guess it was eight to nine, but it's like the changes where there wasn't like too much going on, or even like the the season when we didn't have a patch. You know, I think that there was only like two prior seasons where the the, the best build from like the PTR ended up being the best one throughout the course of the season. And something not being figured out. Though that's not to say uh, we'll we'll be talking about it uh, in a little bit. But that that top necro build right now that is a pretty pretty high mark to try and beat. And so if there's anything that comes out that surpasses that, that's going to be freaking crazy. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Things are already looking pretty spicy. Um, 
I guess the question now, of course, is are you planning to start Necromancer? That's your goal? That's your aim? Uh, for myself, yeah. Uh, I did kind of consider... I was uh, mulling a little bit back and forth just because Unhallowed Essence is such a, a beautiful, wonderful <laughs> set to go through and uh, start off with as a demon hunter of just going through and getting yourself um, set and geared and everything. And I think it actually was... Um, uh, a video I watched from uh, Bloodshed where he was uh, running around with a speed farming build that he had made for the Necromancer, which was the Rathma set. Um, but I figured, eh, well, I'll just go ahead and give it a shot. And just... Uh, Might as well fly. Yeah, or... yeah just, uh, just, stick with, uh, just stick with the Necromancer for the season. Nice. What about you, sir? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel bad because i can recall multiple times being like as soon as the necro's in man it's gonna be a season of necro going with it full ham like all the way and now i'm i'm not mm -hmm. uh i have a few different reasons but i'm starting with the demon hunter in season 11 and potentially i mean not even potentially definitely we'll have other classes as well like the wizard like the necromancer mm -hmm. the thing that i'm considering is that conquests are always a thing, right? And Demon yeah. Hunters by far have proven themselves season after season to be incredibly productive at getting conquests done very quickly. So as much as I've gained experience on the Demon Hunter with, you know, three months of it last season, I just feel like I can blitz conquests early on in season 11. And a lot of them are really good ones, so I want to try to aim for high ranks on them. Mm -hmm. And after that, what my brain is imagining is, I'll be able to transition, you know, into like some shadows impale. We'll go with that because it's fine for speeds, and we're not going to be doing like greater one hundreds and stuff right away. Mm -hmm. And then as the meta starts to solidify and maybe figure itself out, then we can come up for air, take a look around, say, okay, what are what's good? What are people using? And then from there, I'd be like, all right, I'll build a wizard for some speed, like you know, mid nineties to high nineties. Oh, necromancer really is the boss killer now. I can kit that out and get that going. So I feel like I don't need that stuff right away. Whereas I do need a Demon Hunter right away for those early, early season goals. Mm -hmm. So that's my excuse. <laughs> that's, <laughs> you really that's, your, that's your story and you're sticking to it. That's right. That is right. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like There have been things, as I've been testing the Necromancer for the last month and um, trying to come up with builds, there have been a lot of playstyles and things I enjoy about it. But again, like you mentioned, you know, one of the best builds is this uh, Blood Lancer thing that we'll get to. And so much of the proficiency of the Necromancer seems to come out of the blood set. And to me, it's still just like a scary proposition to play that for hardcore. And, and having the inexperience of, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of hours on the class, it's going to be so easy to make mistakes. So I just, I don't know. I just envision like trying to learn at the same time or trying to be really efficient and just all the setbacks that could come from continuing to die over and over as i've proven i can do on the next answer <laughs> it is it is still uh very much so a, a squishy class and i have still i guess do we do we want to talk about it uh skip um skip ahead i guess a little bit and talk about it or do you want to shelve conversation about the bloodlands build until later oh, i mean we've we've alluded to it so many times might as well get the people the info okay um Go for it. unleash yeah. the flood i i just remember what was it? The Necromancer, I think it was out for about a week. Um, I was going through, and I think it was a, it was like Sunday, because I was just, I, I saw the video, and it was talking about, you know, this Necromancer going through and clearing, like, a, a greater of 90. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Watching the video. And I was like, oh, this this looks really awesome. It's like, because at that point in time, before this build, Trang Ols, uh, the, the blood set, was considered um, hot garbage. It was mm -hmm. just, it's like, oh, it needs a lot of buffs. It, it's, you know, it's it's bottom tier. It's it's really wonky and it's crap to use. And then there's this guy, you know, easily clearing through a greater if 90, and he's not even Paragon 800. <laughs> you know, he, he started the rift at, like, Paragon, like, I think it was, like, 794. You know, so it's not even like he has like a bunch of paragons to go through and prop him up, um, or even that high of uh, you know super level legendary gems or anything of that nature. Uh, barely, I think he had one piece of gear augmented, um, and so it was just, it was, it was just crazy. And he didn't proc a single time. It's like the other thing that I still go back and look at that video that you know. 
It was just it seemed to have, have that much leeway and that that like kind of like killiness and control that it it really just it it dictated how he uh, uh, how he played the rift. Like he it, he didn't care about like the monster placements or anything like that. He got to decide how this rift was going and it just offered a lot of control, despite the fact that you know he was. Uh, you know, he had to consume a very large portion of his actual health total in order to kill things, but it was, it was, it was a roller coaster to watch and just trying to think like, how would this, how would this go on hardcore? <laughs> you know, uh, even then, like some of the people that I've been talking with on Twitter that have been like, oh, I've cleared some greater F 95s and never proc once. And it's like, Christ, you know, um, it's, it's insane. It's crazy. Yeah. I think that. You know, it took maybe the announcement because this started to evolve more and more as we realized Anarius, you know, was working in a bug state um, that people were like, well, all right, no more Anarius. So I might as well branch out and see what else the Necromancer can do. So people started to then work on their Rathmas builds and their Tragul builds and, you know, ripping pieces pestilence for right now. But maybe that'll see the light of day uh, mm -hmm. later on. We'll talk about something with that. But yep. Um, it's just, it's interesting how it took the downfall of whatever everyone else was just copying to realize, hey, the Necro actually does have other ways that it can compete in these high-level greater rifts. And everyone was, myself included, was just like, Anarius or nothing. Mm -hmm. And now that Anarius is, is nothing, hey, uh, <laughs> you got Tragools, which is just ruling the roost. At this point, it's, you know, I think the best Claire we've seen now is a 113 or a 115 or something like that. Yeah. Solo. Yeah. Crazy stuff. It's actually insane. So it's actually doing the highest level greater if that a solo class has ever done. Just mm -hmm. like that. And you know, one of, and it, it's even funny to think that Travis at one point was saying, like, you know, we're thinking maybe the blood set's a little too severe, like we might remove the uh, increased health cost and stuff. Yeah. It's like now now you might have to up it, man. <laughs> like, yeah, right. <laughs> and and I'm just going to continue to say it. I said this before what, um, on the last show that I was on. It's Corpse Lance. Yeah. It, it's Corpse Lance. It's goddamn I just, Corpse Lance. <laughs> <laughs> the skill so much crow. I know. I just I should go and get like I'm gonna have to go and buy like one of those like little fake crows from like a party store or something and make a video of eating it. <laughs> how much shit I talked about Corpse Lance. I mean I was right there with you, man. I was backing you <laughs> up. Like I just I personally still so this is one of the like reasons I mentioned I had multiple reasons for not wanting to really necro. One of the things I just don't like Corpse Lance still. It's my mm -hmm. least favorite necromancer skill, despite it being one of the most powerful. And also one of the things I do take issue with is just the fact that a lot of the necromancer's proficiency comes out of Land of the Dead. Yeah. This whole idea of you're cycling either Land of the Dead uptime or run around and wait for Land of the Dead to be up. So it's this, it almost reminds me, honestly, of Long Bombardment. And I remember early on, I was super against Long Bombardment because it was just like, kite, 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 set up mobs, you know, wait for your physical rotation of COE, then dump it all out and then wait again. And it almost feels like this uh, same play style where, you know, you're waiting for the cooldown on LOTD, waiting, waiting, waiting. There it is, destroy everything on screen and then move on. And yeah. I don't know, I just, I, I like when we have, I love that the Necromancer is supposed to be this like active class, you're pushing all the buttons and stuff. And I understand that when you get into high level greater rifts, no matter what, things slow down just because, you know, the rate of health, the rate of survivability, all those things factor into just battle slowing down. But I just don't enjoy these play styles of you have to wait for all your things before you can do things. Yeah. Yeah, um, as uh, Garrett is saying in chat, like, you know, Lawn DH. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the which I, which I don't think that either of us has really ever tried, because that one is just as bad, if not if not probably worse, with, you know, massive cooldown reduction that you can get um, on the Necro for Land of the Dead, because there's no way of speeding up your fan of knife stacks. You have to sit there and literally wait 30 seconds, and then, then you have to wait for, you know, the rotation on COE. Uh, to come around if it doesn't line up properly. So but, true. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it, it's wonky, and one of those things that I just, I, I was always kind of like meh on like these big, super powerful, like two minute cooldowns that you have to stack like a shit ton of cooldown reduction in order to like make effective. 
And I, I know it's because like Trangles is in such a good place uh, because in a lot of the, the top Necromancer builds because Land of the Dead and Corpse Lance uh, specifically, their interaction is just so powerful. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't like stacking cooldown reduction. You know, it mm -hmm. seems it seems like such a uh, a crappy stat to have to stack, and that was like a big problem with you know like the original cooldown stacker, you know the Akrat's Champion Crusaders, yes. that they they had a lot of issues with their scaling because they had to sacrifice so much to put everything into cooldown reduction. Um, but now it's kind of like these big two minute cooldowns are being designed specifically you know, for that purpose that, you know, it's like, it's, it's going to make like the cooldown reduction worth it instead of like, you have to, in order to make the set worth work, that this is just like, you'll get a lot out of it if you do. Yeah. And I mean, at this point, I don't really see, like, I think it's just going to be a build, you know, because the way that the Johnstone works and, and honestly, some of the builds aren't even running Johnstone now because... Yeah, no, yeah, the, the top uh, Bloodlands build does not run Johnstone because the only time they do damage is in Land of the Dead when it's not active. Right, so yeah, so there's, there's like, not even that. But just even thinking of an item like that, mm -hmm. you know, further propels the idea, like, Land of the Dead is going to not only give you power when it's up, but also when it's down, too. Yeah. So there's, like, all these mitigating factors on why you should be using this you know big cooldown skill and i think that's good like there should be um there should be reasons to want to use those because otherwise they're so they seem like such big penalties because it's one button that you press and then you have to forget about it for a while mm -hmm. um of course except for the instances with all this massive cooldown that people are trying to um, pull together it's it's a bummer because when i look at the johnstone i feel like that actually if that existed in a version for army of the dead it could actually make army of the dead more useful too and i, I guess i wouldn't want to see that problem i'm kind of jumping a little bit but i wouldn't want to see that problem solved in the same way because then you're kind of engendering maybe the same problem dressed up in a different set almost mm -hmm. um, trying to make army of the dead good and maybe it gets too good because now you have the massive cooldown coming out of the two piece of Rathma and then you know is everyone just doing army of the dead stuff and now that just replaces land of the dead stuff and I don't know mm -hmm. it, it is cool though to see that without AOTD being super useful you are still seeing builds with simulacrum now too with the whole like singularity mages yeah um, people wanting to take advantage of the increased essence pool that you can get from one of the runes on simulacrum so, I mean, you're seeing two out of three of the big cooldowns being used. So that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, I guess we will be talking about this a little bit uh, in the future, but we found out from uh, Nevelistus did a uh, talk show yesterday over on Geek and Sundry, the uh, Game Escape? Game Engine. Game Engine, that was it. Escape Rooms. Stuck in my head. <laughs> um, a, a game engine um, talk show where they went and talked a little bit about Diablo 3 and what it's like to be a community manager at Blizzard and such. And, you know, she did confirm that, you know, this the Necromancer in its current state is pretty much how it's just going to stay for Season 11 unless they find something that's uh, like a big outlier or some other bug or exploit. Um, <laughs> cough, future foretelling. Um, <clears throat> that... Uh, that they'll just leave it as is and they'll worry about further balance and tuning, you know, after the season ends. Yeah, so this one might come as a little bit of a surprise because there probably were when Travis was popping into some of the streams of, you know, like Riker, Bloodshed, etc. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these videos and, <clears throat> and Reddit posts were being produced saying, oh, here's some coming changes. It seemed more immediate at that time. Oh, yeah. Um, and maybe that was just the way that it was either being presented or the way that people were hoping it would go. Um, but obviously, you know, this revelation kind of shows that the Necro is just going to be in a state that it's in. And there are definitely some bugs still. There are definitely some, like, Fueled by Death still is a passive that's just straight up not working. Mm -hmm. um, and they even, you know, we'll probably talk about this in the next uh, section. But just, you know, there was a small patch earlier this week to kind of fix some things since they had hot fixed some other things. And then something broke and they had to fix that. So, you know, it's always in this continual... Uh, need to be upgraded and fixed but i think you you had said uh before we started and, and on previous shows you know the necromancer is gonna really get its first big pass between seasons 11 and 12. yeah i um 
and when I was originally talking about that, I, I fully expected the Necromancer to actually release and be a little bit of a uh, middle of the pack, you know, type class um, when it uh, when it released. That it wasn't going to come in and be like super uh, uber powerful. It wouldn't be the top solo clear, and that it would get uh, its big like balance and tuning fix, and maybe some additional items after season eleven, after it was in the hands of everyone for a couple of months. They could see where it was failing, where it needed to be propped up. Um, but well. Uh, that was right and wrong because well, it was right in the sense that yeah there's some stuff like we know that the team is um, unhappy with the way like the pestilence set is uh, currently performing mm -hmm. uh, it's in uh, its intended goal was to be like the speed farm set and that at some point in the future it will be getting uh, buffs probably something to do with movement speed uh, or even just getting like the fueled by death passive working uh, as well as adding uh, corpse Lance and Corpse Explosion onto like the six piece set bonus to give it some uh, more powerful damage. Though, given how well Corpse Lance performs without it, yeah. maybe we might. Who knows? They they might have thought that and then looked at it. And it's like, oh well, it's actually in a pretty good spot right now. Uh, just between like Pestilence is a, a set that does use um, the John Stone uh, and the right. corpse in the Corpse Whisper pauldrons. Uh, right. And is actually probably Pestilence is my uh, most favorite playstyle on the, the Necromancer. That that is the one that I have the most fun playing. Interesting. Uh, and, and it's because of Corpse Lance. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so gratifying. You know, it's just like running around and throwing corpses at things. It's it's fun. It's not something I get to do in my everyday life. So it's nah, no, <laughs> no. Sadly, no. Oh, um, yeah. Maybe yeah. the, at least the bone spear part, though, right? Yeah, that's pretty much like your morning routine. Oh yeah, totally, totally. Okay. As, as, yeah. You know, it's like having to turn off the TV, just pff, bone spear. Well, I feel like you and probably then... wake up and play with uh, some bones. <laughs> <clears throat> Wait, what? Was uh, I, I think I think that was, was lost was in it, translation. Was there? Was it, what a dick. Um, <laughs> hey. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh. But I actually was going to ask you that. So Pestilence is your favorite uh, playstyle. So what are you aiming for? You know, Rathma is the Hadrix gift for Necros in Season yep. 11. And then from there, of course, you, you've seen some decent Rathma's builds come out. People have been able to do Greater Rift 100, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, again, talking about, like, Singularity. You've seen some Blood Mage stuff uh, out, inside of the Trag set again. Um, Corpse Lance, Blood Lance stuff. So, like, what are you, what, like, how do you envision your season in terms of builds that you'll try to aim for? Uh, I mean, at at the end of the day, even though Pestilence is my favorite, it isn't um, anywhere near the top performing builds uh, for the uh, the Necromancer. Uh, all, it is it is outshined by all three of the other sets. So I might uh, I might go in there and try and see you know how far I can push it or what fun I can have with Pestilence. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I will probably end up settling on you know one of the the Rathma builds. Uh, you know, it, I always going going into not even uh, launch, but the the beta. I talked about it a lot, especially on my stream. I did a lot of uh, practicing and testing with different thorns builds for the necromancer. Oh and it yeah, is, it is really uh, great seeing a thorns build is one of the the top performing. Uh, I think it is like the top performing solo set outside of the blood lance build, uh, and see how brave I. Uh, See how brave I can get actually doing uh, that Blood Lancer on Hardcore. Oh boy, this will be fun to watch. <laughs> to keep an eye on you. Maybe well, get a death counter going for the <laughs> workshop again. Yes. I'll have to borrow one from Dainty. Hey! Oh! <laughs> Bone Spears fired. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, I was curious what your answer would be because if. Well, when I do my Necromancer stuff, I mean, whatever the boss killer is, is probably what I'll be going with. Mm -hmm. But I, of the testing that I've done, you know, I, I love Denarius and its sort of brokenness and just the crazy. It, it was awesome to see Mira and I be good again, right? Oh, yeah. Totally brought back uh, flashbacks of Condemn and just the, the heavenly beams coming from the sky and stuff. So it was nice to see that callback. Anarius still is kind of my favorite just because of the open-endedness to it, but it does feel like maybe, unless we haven't just found like the next best Anarius build, that it does need that little boost back 
to get it into relevance with all the other cool builds that are happening. Mm-hmm. But outside of Venarius, I think I like Rathma as well, too. I like the idea of the command skeletons. Just being able to command single-target pets is really awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, and the interaction that's there with Jesseth, which is, like, the worst... I'm sure that someone's name, like, you know, worked into the set, but my goodness, being able to say the Jesseth set five times fast is probably my, like... Biggest conquest for season 11. <laughs> I just cannot get that out ever. But the Jesseth scythe and shield set um, mixed in with Rathma. Like, you know, so many of your pieces are kind of forced at that point. Like, you have eight pieces there that you have to use. But, man, that when it's all working together, it's working. Oh, yeah. Had a little so bit of my, a... I'm into that. Yep. It, uh, sorry about that. It... Uh... The music decided to autoplay into something strange there. Oh. Yep. My bad. Um, got that taken care of. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one is... Uh, I don't know what... Uh, what is that being shortened to? The Jess set? Sure. I hadn't even <laughs> thought of a shortening. Yeah. The J set. <laughs> the J set, yep. Uh, which I think that that is also one of those ones that uh, lore-wise was more of a recent uh, invention, that name. I think it was in the Book of Tyrael. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because uh, Jesseth, I believe, is the, the deaf speaker or the, the leader of the Necromancers. Okay. I, I assumed it was like some developer name, but that's that's actually cool. That's tied to the lore. Uh, I mean, it uh, it could because, like I said, that one is it, its first appearance was the the Book of Tyrael. If it is the one that I'm thinking of. Gotcha. Yeah. So I mean, even even that could very easily, yes, be a um, a developer. Indeed. All right. So I guess we've pretty much touched on everything we wanted to necro wise s11 wise any like final thoughts in terms of seasonal plans are you going with you know the similar cheese and meat platter and things like that you got your uh rock stars or full throttles whatever full, that you full like throttles to. how i've only been drinking them for how long on the show <laughs> and you fucking go to Rockstar? the hell is wrong with you god it's not, it's not the same thing did i just did i mess up Okay, thank you everybody for joining us tonight <laughs> on the West Parks Workshop. So this will be our uh, final recording. Final. <laughs> With that, that was all it took to end this. And that should answer the question in chat of, as to what my drink of choice is for tonight. <laughs> Damn, it feels very st- How much are they paying you over there? You feel very strongly about that. Ah, God. Oh, boy. But in, in any case, so like, yes, full throttle then? I think that full throttle's got you roid raging. Uh, it's uh, what? I'm calm. I'm good. I'm good now. Uh, good. But yeah, no, uh, yeah, I just thought uh, I'm going to do uh, like my traditional thing. I'll have a couple, a couple of full throttles on hand alongside uh, like a little, um, I like those little like uh, um, meat, cheese, and cracker, like kind of like hors d'oeuvre um little ready-made packs uh and uh excuse me um i uh f- a little fruit cup oh nice. or it's not even like a little one they'll do like the the bowls of like the the cantaloupe watermelon and uh, honeydew uh, over at uh, Publix, and those ones are pretty nice they they help carry me through actually fruit is a really great source of energy because it's you know on the healthier side. I mean, mm-hmm. some fruits have a lot of sugar, but in general, it's on the healthier side. And actually, I've heard a little statistic. We, I don't know if we've said this on the show before, but an apple is supposed to have the equivalent, like, energy slash pick-me-up of a cup of coffee. I did not know that. Yeah, there's your TIL. There you go. So, fun yeah. stuff. Uh, I'm with you. Definitely going to... I have to make my grocery run tomorrow. I was going to do it tonight, and I came home passed out. We had a 90-degree day up here. Nine? <laughs> Nine. Zero degree day up here, so it was super hot. And you know how some days, like even though you spend a lot of your time inside, like air conditioned buildings and stuff, you just have those five minutes walking outside, and all of a sudden your energy is just zapped. Mm-hmm. Now it hit me like a ton of bricks today. So came home and I had all the plans in the world to finally finish up my chores before season eleven hits, and just conked out. So definitely gonna hit up the store, get some energy drinks, get some. Uh, I like pretzels. It's always been one of my staples. 
some easy meals, maybe like some mac and cheese or something. Just really like quick things you can make and not to pay too much attention to. Mm -hmm. And just go ham, hit the 24 hour, you know, stream thing and hopefully beyond and just have an insane weekend. I took Friday off work too, so I'm going like all four days crazy. Yeah, um, I, like, like I was saying at the earlier uh, part of the show, I do not know if I have plans for this weekend or not. <laughs> I'm Ron Burgundy. I, uh, I'm Ron Burgundy. Um, so, yeah, I will, I will, I have at least plans to go through and match, you know, kind of like all through uh, Thursday and Friday. Nice. Since this, this, uh, the last couple of seasons have been either plagued by uh, working the either like working that day that evening or the day after and so not being able to like kind of like fully go through and commit but uh what do you have uh what do you have set up for your uh your stream team yeah yeah so group wise um we're going with the group that we ended this season with so mm -hmm. last season we started with uh dead advocate myself lala and no one's minion and then dead kind of um petered out a little bit looks like he's back which is cool for the necro stuff he's all about mm -hmm. it but yeah. we're, we just decided to carry forward since we developed so much good group synergy by the time Season 10 was done. Uh, and we know like everyone's play style, and we're going to be running similar comps anyways to some degree to start. Uh, we figured might as well keep that synergy going. So it's going to be Viper, Lala, No One's Minion, and myself. And then I'm on a DH to start. Lala's on a Wizard. Viper's on a Wizard, which is a different start Ooh. for him. Usually he goes Witch Doctor, but mm -hmm. I think he's going to start Wizard, transition to Witch Doctor. And uh, no one's minion is on the monk, so we'll have kind of like that early support there. And I think, I think uh, she's gonna make a barb, and then Lala's gonna make a monk, so there'll be some They're transitioning. Switching. Yeah, it's it's gonna be mm -hmm. different. It's gonna be weird. <laughs> They're switching roles. It's good that they can do that. Yes, mm -hmm. their switches <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so steeped in all sorts of coded words. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm really excited because the never have I ever been able to build on a previous season's work. You know, it's always been like a changing rotation of who we start with. I mean, you, normally it's you and I, and then we would include some other you know people here and there, and then those people might drop out because they're not planning to do like a whole 24 hour thing, and then Lala would be, and then she'd pop in, or you know, so there'd be so many shifting of the sands. And now it'll be interesting to just go, you know, this is it from what we just finished with, and now we're starting with it. Mm-hmm. Curious to see how far we go. All our goals are to beat everything we previously did. So hire four-player, hire solos, all that good stuff. Yeah. Hire and, Paragon. I mean, with uh, the, like we were mentioning earlier, kind of like that Necromancer X Factor uh, thrown in there that has the potential to go through and push it. Especially not even just that, but just like uh, starting off with like that, that dedicated uh, strategy that I kind of developed halfway through the season last time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to do it from day one. Mm hmm. Uh, only, like we always talk about, right? The snowball effect is so real in this game. Oh, yeah. You get it. You yeah, get it started. It's all, it's the key is having that strong start. And it, it saves you so much time, like going forward in the future. Yeah. 100 percent all right next so, topic yes i think i think we kind of went through and covered uh, the the generalness of like the the season 11 stuff Agreed. Uh, yep and there was kind of like the ominous foreshadowing like probably the the biggest thing uh that's been kind of rolling around the community uh since the last episode is uh this uh, big exploit that people have been talking about. And... Yeah, man, this um, this has been such a weird thing. It really developed over the course of between this last show that we did and this current one. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, the aftermath of it resolved this. Well, some people would argue that it's not over, but sort of the final results of everything kind of transpired this weekend, mm -hmm. past weekend with the uh, EXP buff. But that's kind of starting at the end. So let's start at the beginning. Um, Necromancer released, right? End mm -hmm. of June. And one of the things that was a thing previously, uh, we're talking like seasons ago at this point, was the interaction between, you know, the item exists, Sever. A mm -hmm. lot of people will find it and throw it away or whatever. Some enterprising individuals realize that that sort of execution factor, um, where it just gives you that insane number to, you know, give you that really nice feeling of, I just did crazy damage to this enemy and blew it, it up. It was the original frailty. 
Exactly. Just the ridiculous quadra billion trillion damage number to look really cool. We didn't realize that that could actually be utilized through other skills that kind of um, spread big damage numbers out into smaller damage numbers. If you have a huge base that you're working with, it's going to spread out a still ridiculous number to any other mobs and eventually kill those too. So the skill that kind of helps that go forward is Mark for Death on the Demon Hunter with the Grim Reaper rune in particular. Mm -hmm. So like the one enemy that you mark, um, when that dies, you then spread that damage from killing that enemy over a sort of set radius. So any monsters within that radius will take, you know, a fraction of that damage. But a fraction of an insane number is a slightly less insane number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, that interaction was discovered and then subsequently removed. And I can't recall if it was deemed as an exploit back then, but I do feel like there were potentially some actions against people that were egregious abusers of it. Um, yeah. No, no. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. But even even by that, that's one of those ones where it's like you know, like, uh, well, I try to remember the name of the movie, but it's like, I'm in I'm in jail now for stuff that's legal. You know, it's <laughs> like yeah, you know, like some Wall Street broker that got imprisoned in the '80s, and then like the things that he was thrown in jail for is now just like common practice. You right. know, it's like because the people were using that exploit, I think, like what to get to, like greater of sixty. <laughs> you know, yeah. anyway, to, to put it to put it into perspective this was a very long time ago yes 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 yeah and maybe that's part of why this wasn't caught on release because like you mentioned sever was the original frailty and then frailty became a thing with a super ridiculous number for execution and all of a sudden that interaction is back again but this time it was just sort of the perfect storm of it coming up as um, something that was, oh, we can do this. This this works. And then it's the 4th of July. You know, people at Blizzard are out of their offices. So no matter what, like, it's not going to be addressed. Then they're going to get back into the offices. And there's always that kind of like spin up time. Maybe some people are still on vacation. So now the, the uh, exploit bug, whatever, is going for a few days. Then they try to deploy a hotfix, but the hotfix won't take for several days. And we actually, we actually extend across the weekend having this uh, bug exploit interaction continuing. And it wasn't essentially until about a week later, a week of this thing existing, that it was finally shut down, shut off. Um, and that was just the first part of the saga, if you want to pick up the story from here. Um, yeah, and... Sorry, I, my mind just went blank. I was trying to... I was reading an email there. Oh, all right. I can hop back I'm, in then. I'm so bad at this. It's all right. So in any case, um, there was some messaging delivered from Blizzard <laughs> in terms of, you know, when it, when the hotfix wasn't going to take, they were like, hey, we realize this thing is really bad. We don't want people to use it. They actually explicitly said, do not use the exploit. Mm -hmm. Those were the words delivered by Kauza, uh, community manager. And people still continue to use it. Like, I actually was in um, one of the communities for Hardcore Greater Rifts, and there were, like, people... I'm actually going to name a little bit of name call, but there were some NCG clan members who were literally like, hey, anybody want to use the exploit? Looking to use this exploit before it gets turned off. There were people, like, actively <laughs> recruiting groups for it. Mm -hmm. And and they went and got, like, ridiculous Greater Rift clears with it. I don't know how many times they went for it, and who knows how many groups actually <laughs> used it. And didn't kill the boss or things like that like it, there's could have been so many different things that were happening mm -hmm. um but it was just uh, uh no softcore was super prevalent if you looked at those boards you just saw like people 20 plus greater rifts ahead of any sort of normal quote-unquote clears mm -hmm. and that meant their gems were getting up to those higher levels their augments were getting up to those higher levels the paragon earned was off the charts um and then the response from Blizzard was to roll back the gems that any of these people had gained like ridiculously high levels on mm -hmm. to whatever was potentially the highest at the current time, which apparently was 132. 132 Someone yeah. actually, yeah, legitimately had 132 gems, level gems. So that's what all the exploiters or people that abuse this thing to no end got their gems rolled back to. And then there were sort of messages without saying anything in specific that you know there would be further action on a, like a one-on-one -on -one case review basis so we don't really know for certain who got what punishments and things like that some people said they started to notice names being removed from leaderboards and such so 
some accounts likely did get actioned. But no matter what, I feel as though uh, this was just a, a rough handling of the situation. And even still, some people, and it depends on what side of the fence you fall on, but some mm-hmm. people feel like non-season is kind of ruined forever now. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it does greatly impact um, how the era is going to uh, play out, you know, because it's just the start of a new era. You know, so they're they're gonna have a lot that they're gonna have to compare this to for the next. Uh, eras last longer than seasons. Yeah. Yeah. Though, depending upon how many changes they might make um, with the the next patch or the next season, they they could end the era and start over fresh again, or even just because of the exploit, they might uh, want to do that anyways. But yeah. Um, and they they also they talked about this a little bit on that uh, uh, talk show that uh, Brandy was on yesterday. Uh, that apparently there was a there was some failings on how that they could actually go through. There was apparent there was some technical limitations on how they could go through and address it. Uh, There's also just issues about not wanting to go through and hit uh, people that were innocent mm-hmm. that might have just been in the group and not known anything about that being an exploit or anything like that and not wanting to uh, punish those people that weren't actively participating in it and so that they might have uh, erred on the side of uh, leniency Mm -hmm. Uh, and then one of the biggest uh, things that they talked about was just that there was a definite problem with communication and that one they kind of took ownership with because uh, the two people that are in charge of like going through like the global communications uh, Nevelistus and Tivalier uh, were both taking uh, back-to-back week vacations. So for the first part of it, that this thing like really started exploding, Nevelistus was on vacation. She came back and had one day to get primed on how everything was handling uh, before then Tivalier went on vacation for a week. Interesting. And so, yeah, they, they do. Uh, they did admit that there was, you know, that they, they could have handled at least the, the communicating that this is an exploit. Don't do it, you know, sooner, um, as well as maybe a bit better, like, uh, follow-up communication as for what they're going to do. But, yeah, they, they never discuss uh, account actions uh, publicly. Right. Uh, so that, that's always that's always one of those things. Like, people want to go through and hear, you know, we want to know that you ban their accounts. And the, the only thing that Blizzard's ever going to say is that, you know, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take direct action against some people. But they're never going to outright say what was done and so they always want to leave that one vague um i know there's just some you know kind of like there's some legal reasons as to why you want to go through and not like publicly talk about it but also just you know privacy concerns about not wanting to go through and you know throw people under the bus for saying that you know like these people you know were uh exploiters and such so there's there's definitely like what what can you do if you know your your level uh, how far in the detail that you could talk about your the amount of actioning that you do on the account is so limited and and then also at the end of the day uh they're not the ones that actually handle the the banning right yeah, yeah, yeah there's they're, the the cheats, hacks and cheats team or whatever. Yeah, that that goes over to a completely different team. That's the one that's responsible for going through, um, hunting down um, cheaters, exploiters, verifying whether uh, that they could undoubtedly prove that this person was knowingly using the exploit and such. Uh, that's not even handled by anyone on team three. Yeah, it has abs- that the the account actions and stuff like that have absolutely nothing to do with the the developer team or even the community team uh, for Diablo three. Mm-hmm. See, so I it's I appreciate like the nuances of the situation, and I'm not I'm not even trying to be here to like label blame or say like this this person should have done this or whatnot. The only thing that I don't buy is the innocence factor. You cannot tell me that you get into a group with someone and they say, "Hey, we're doing a greater if 140," and you've never fucking done a greater if 140 before. Yep. And think that that's like normal. Like, how is that a thing? Like, there, there's no one. I don't. I don't believe that there were like pickup greater rifts where someone was just like, "Let me do a public greater rift." And they're like, "Hey, we're doing 140." You're like, dude, I can't survive a 140. Like, no, don't worry about it. There's interaction exists where it's totally legit. And even though you've never done a greater rift nearly this high before, you're gonna be innocent in this. Like, I feel like no one goes into that non-complicit. 
or well, uncomplicit, whatever the word is. Well, what about people that were just doing like 135s? I mean, like, I, where do you draw I, the line, right? I, sure. I know. It's like one of those things. I could definitely go through and see that there were probably, there were no innocent parties in those people that were doing like 140s or higher. But what about like people that just were doing like 128s? Or like one thirty fives. Like, should they should they get banned? Like, though, I'm pretty sure that when they talk about like the innocent people, that it's more so those and not That's the people great. that were doing something like absolutely fucking crazy. You know, right, right, right. Yeah, you because know, because you, you go through and we're we're focusing just on those people that were doing those insane things, but there could have been you know how many thousands of other people that were just doing, you know, like a high twenties low 30s mm -hmm. you know using I'm, I'm sure point, like as, which was which was like it's... a big push you know like for them uh but they they would have at that point they just would have seen oh well this is the new build right and honestly those people don't affect the microcosm of seasonal stuff as badly as the most egregious ones because anyone that was pushing like 140 plus or high 130s they're the ones who are getting beyond the level of where the sort of meta is at currently right oh yeah so that's why i'm saying like those are offenders that no doubt should be targeted and maybe those aren't the ones that we're talking about are the innocent ones like you said mm -hmm. um however i feel like no matter what if you say you're being lenient if you say like we're not going to try to ban every single offender of this thing you are affecting the innocence because all the people that are innocent are the people that didn't use the exploit right and if any single person exists that benefited from this in, an, in a way that they didn't deserve to, they are inadvertently or advertently, if they're taking ranks away from a non-exploiter, affecting the innocent. Yeah. So it's impossible to say that you're going to protect the innocent by not actioning, you know, people that didn't go ham on this thing or that weren't, um, you know, uh, abusing it to such a whatever the level is of the threshold that we say, like, that's too much. Because mm -hmm. no matter what, like, if you, you either catch everyone or you catch no one. And if you haven't caught everyone, then everyone's affected. Yeah, there's. Uh, they actually talked about it on uh, Game Engine uh, about. Uh, there's something that I didn't know about. There was some sort of like big exploit or cheat that happened way back in the day with Team Fortress Two. Oh, and, okay. And the way that the developers went about it um, was they didn't. I think it was. It wasn't so much that they didn't like punish. Uh, people that there was like rollbacks and stuff but instead of like punishing the people that did use like the exploit to like get experience or levels or whatever it was uh, that the people that were found to have never used it or participated in it they all got a special cosmetic item that would be awesome yeah so yeah like, reward, like it, reward following the rules yeah exactly because that is kind I, of the other side of the coin right yeah you know it's like what do, what do you get for you know playing by the book or maybe you maybe you accidentally went through and were using the exploit um inadvertently and you just thought well this is a creative use of game mechanics um but then as soon as they went through and announced that this is an exploit don't do it you stopped you know mm -hmm. at that point i don't know um that's uh, i mean it's it's tough like no matter what at this point oh i guess the last part of this is that um it feels like part of maybe the response package and the way that things were handled was also because Blizzard themselves felt some guilt about how this happened and, you know, was trying to attribute less of that to maybe the players more on themselves, so not punishing super heavily to the players if they believe that, you know, it was their own misgiving for not catching something like this in the first place or not uh, cutting off the, the water hose sooner, etc. So I felt like that was being messaged a little bit near the end. And then also they did the EXP, double EXP weekend this past weekend, um, which, you know, is it's a, it's a drop in the bucket when it doesn't help you get your gems higher or anything like that or your augments higher. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess it's better than nothing, technically. Yeah. A, a salvo of sorry. Yeah. And, you know, uh, who knows? Who knows? Yeah, and I will never know the uh, the full numbers of uh, how many people that did have their accounts actioned, how far it goes. Did they did they only focus? Did they you know you were going through and talking about how you saw people uh, in like one of the community chats actively looking for people to use the exploit with, you know if I'm pretty sure that they would be able to go through and pull up those uh, those chats from those communities and you know if they hadn't I'm 
sure that after listening to this that they can then go back and do that because all all that stuff is logged you know and recorded they can go back and look at those mm-hmm. chats you know months afterwards um that you know say they never uh hell like, let's say that they just use the exploit to go through and do like super quick like 120s or something like that you know could they I'm pretty sure if they they were actively advertising, hey, I'm looking for someone to go and use the exploit, that those are the type of people that had their accounts actioned and, you know, were banned, if not, you know, worse. Yeah, I I hope so. Mm -hmm. Uh, I just feel like the... And, like, a lot of people are like, why are you so fired up about it? It's non-season. You're a seasonal player and stuff like that. And to be honest, like, I technically don't care. In the grand scheme of everything that I do in Diablo, I don't care because I'm not a seasonal. I'm not. I'm not a non-seasonal player. So, you know, those boards. I'm like, hey, I can get a mark at the end of the season when I'm still kind of interested in pushing. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm not there actively pushing them. However, I think there's something to be said for you know. There's like that famous Martin Luther King quote, like, uh, "Threat to justice somewhere is a threat to no injustice is a threat to justice everywhere." I don't know, I'm butchered it, but it's kind of the same thing. Where like, if you see some cheating happening. You should always be against it if that's mm-hmm. where your moral standpoints are. Like, a, imagine if this did happen in season, I'd mm-hmm. be really, really, really upset. And you know, the measures for things when situations similarly pop up, you know, I'd like to see action and swift action. So it, I feel like it's worth raising your voice if it's a concern for you to make sure that you know, Blizzard hears you and hopefully will um, be receptive to doing more maybe in the future. Yeah. Yeah, especially if if anything short of just communicating with the player base, uh, you know, in a in a better way, you know, mm-hmm. uh, more uh, having having quicker action upon going through and deeming it an exploit, uh, kind of like put the, uh, the the line in the sand out there sooner, you know, so as to try and uh, curtail it a little bit faster, and then also be so that way you can go through and you know. Uh, justify taking action against more accounts or being able to you know even like put a notification into the game like when you go through and you have like the little um you know little uh qa pop like up logging you know, in yeah to just go yeah. through and be you know how many for how long in season 10 do we have to every time we log in have to <laughs> welcome to season 10 uh pop up you know go through and have something like that where you just do like a a quick uh quick patch or a quick you know, hot fix or something like that. So that way, when you come in, you have a little this little broadcast. Don't use the fucking exploit, bro. You know, type thing. <laughs> bro. <laughs> yeah, you will be banned. You know, uh, just so that way, you know, it can at least um, put a little fear g- out there. Put a little fear, and I guess give them a bit more leeway in their ability with which to action. Uh, accounts because it really sounded like that they they felt the onus was on them because they didn't communicate it. Uh, as as well as they could have I and is why they, yeah. is why they were a bit more lenient i, I would say you know it's like it's it, it's uh if you if you saw the uh, brandy's talk about it it makes a lot more sense but that unfortunately um geek and sundry yeah the geek and sundry you have to be a subscriber to actually watch their vods so i don't think that the there'll be any easy way of going through and uh catching the the replay of that talk that she had uh, unless they they go back and further uh, communicate on it, but I'm I'm not sure if they're going to with uh, the the season opener coming. Right, it's like we almost want to move on to bigger, better things. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, well, you know, we have these little snafus that pop up in the community from time to time. I'm glad that you know we have these discussions because I think it helps just to kind of center ourselves in terms of you know what went down. How do we feel about it? What we've wanted to see? Do. It's almost the same as, you know, applying the mode of thinking that we do to when, like, new sets come in or changes come in. It's like, well, okay, they addressed this change to this class. Is it a good change, bad change? What could they have done better? So there's always sort of that same, you know, even even with communication, there's the iterative process, too. You know, it's more chances for them to get it right in a different manner in the future. Mm-hmm. So word on that. So that's your rundown on uh, the latest exploit fiasco. Probably won't be the last, but hopefully it'll be the last one for quite some time. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, like you said, at least uh, a little bit thankful that it was uh, found and dealt with before the season opened. Yeah, to everyone who was like, why don't you just start the season right away? Here's your sign. (laughs) Yeah. 
this is the reason why I guess we got this nice big chunk of time in between because things like this were likely to happen. I think someone's, some ones had said, and this is the thing, I can't verify everything that everyone's saying, but some people are like, oh, this was a bug that was reported in, P in the closed beta, et cetera, and stuff. So, you know, who knows to what degree that is the case or not. But, I mean, no matter what, I am happy at the very least that the sanctity of S11 has not been wrecked in, you know, week one with something like this going mm -hmm. through. Um, all right, so we want to pop into this one last. Uh, actually, we have a couple of last. A couple of last is that even? A couple a thing? of last. <laughs> a couple of last news mm -hmm. items. We did get the quick uh, patch earlier this week that yep. coincided with um, the hot fix that sort of ties into what we we're just talking about. So they did the hot fix to shut off the exploit, and at that same time, they also did a couple of other things. Like um, one of the major complaints for Rathma set users was that, man, it's just not fun to spam Skeletal Mages. It feels like you're always punished for not having the max, max. 10 out because mm -hmm. that's the only way you max your six-piece power. And so they actually lowered it. Uh, well, okay, that's a bad way to start. They <laughs> kept the max power that you can get out of the six-piece. However, they gave the threshold for how many uh, Skeletal Mages you need out lower. Yep, so now you only need four? Four was... of those guys, yep, 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 to hit the max. Yep, so you only need the four skeletal mages. So that they, they made it um, easier to maintain, and you're not going crazy trying to always have 10 out. You still want 10. You can still get to 10. Because it still is more DPS because you have more mages, you know, going through and shotgunning with that huge damage bonus. But you don't at least feel penalized for, like, hitting a dead zone and not being able to recover your essence enough to get... And you, you drop down to, you drop a, a couple skeletal mages, and then all of a sudden your DPS plummets. Precisely. So that's definitely a welcome change. Um, there were a bunch of other just kind of random things. One of my favorites is uh, the adventure mode change, where when defeating enemies in rifts, and this applies to challenge rifts, God, yes. crater rifts, aren't you? Uh, it is the best. The, it, it is, because it's like that was. Uh, like one of the biggest issues and I'm glad to see that this was actually like a bug that needed to be fixed but I'm sure everyone that's experienced this in the past month just like you fucking have to run halfway across the rift to pick up the orbs when you kill an elite like it's this was this was crazy yeah so now with those orbs flying all over the place they rain that in literally so now the progress orbs that spawn will be closer to the defeated enemy and, you know, one of the things I was actually talking to Mikey about this, we think that it had something to do with just the physics engine of the game. Because you know how the bodies all fly all over the place. And I think because Necromancer skills are particularly visceral. And, I mean, it's happening across other classes killing stuff too. But it almost seemed like because there was, like, corpse explosions and things literally, like, imploding that potentially the orbs were also following that same physics. And maybe they just amped it up to 11 or something, and that's why it was all over the place. Uh, very much so. But anyways, I'm so happy that now, uh, you know, there's still going to be, like, those challenge rift runs where you get your best run when all the orbs are exactly where you need them with no wasted movement. But yep. hopefully that situation will be a little bit easier to manufacture if, now if, that they're not all over. Yeah, because if I have to run back to pick up an orb while using an Averse, uh, the Averse band, you know something is wrong. <laughs> Very yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. And then pretty much the rest of the hotfix changes follow things like this, just small little quality of life improvements. Like a yeah. lot of, there, how many Reddit threads did you see about the Morbun gauntlets? Yeah. Squelch, squelch, squelch. Yep. <laughs> so that got changed. Yep. Uh, Necromancer portraits have been updated. Yes. For the player icons, but not stash tabs. That's right, yep. So you can still see the old work-in-progress art on your mm -hmm. stash tabs if you miss it. <laughs> yep. I get feeling a lot of people don't miss it. I and don't. then, of course... Yeah, I don't think you, anyone you don't? will be lamenting that. No? No so, nostalgia no. For, for days gone by? Mm, nah. No? <laughs> you can also use the new art on your avatars in the forums, too. That mm. got updated as well. Did not know that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does that speak to how much you visit the uh, forums? <laughs> I've actually been visiting the, the forums quite a bit recently. Oh. Yeah. There you go. Uh, just to keep tabbed on things, because just, you know, like with the, the early theory crafting for the Necromancer and such, it uh, it took a little while for the um, the Reddit 
Necromancer um, or the Necromancer subreddit to go through, get alive, and get active. And so most of the conversation was happening on like the uh, the official forums. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, and one other thing that was in there too, I should just closed it because I thought I would remember what I was going to say before I did. But oh, so when this went live, when this hot fix went up, or sorry, when this patch went up, because it was actually a small patch. It actually broke stacks, which was really unfortunate. A lot of people were kind of freaking out because you would use your mm -hmm. bone armor. And previously, yeah. you could see, okay, I have 10 stacks of bone armor. Mm -hmm. You know, I go and get this next guy, and I still have my 10 stacks. And now when the patch went up, you couldn't see anything. You just had bone armor active. You're like, I might have six, I might have one, I might have three. So that actually got quickly fixed. That was fixed yesterday, and the patch went up uh, Monday. Mm -hmm. So a nice quick turnaround. Definitely needed that one. It was also affecting other non-necromancer stuff too like um soul harvest and sweeping wind all the any stack skill essentially you couldn't read how many you had yeah and this kind of like goes back and reminds me of i think it was like through like most of like mop or cars or mop or cata cataclysm for world of warcraft they would do some sort of fix to fix some bug in like the current raid content like firelands or like mogushan palace and then they would note that uh, the chess event is now broken in Karazhan. So it's like this 10-man raid from three expansions ago. Whatever it is that they fixed in current content broke something from three expansions. And it's like, what? You know, just how, uh, <laughs> how interconnected a lot of that stuff is that you don't, you don't think that, you know, fixing a, a bug on this heroic mode boss would cause another boss from a completely unrelated instance to freak out. This is true. Mm-hmm. It's all connected. The cycle. <laughs> Everything in the balance. <laughs> and then one uh, last sort of Blizzard um, issued news posting was uh, earlier this week. Or actually, it might have been last week. What's today? Today's 19th. Actually, yeah, this is one week ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Brandy made a post, Nevalistis, noting that the challenge rifts, if you guys aren't familiar with how the leaderboards work, they show you the most current challenge rift and the rankings for that the top 1000 and then the previous weeks so now we're on week three no four four we're in week four that's right week four of challenge rifts so you cannot you can no longer see weeks one or two week three is in the rear view so that's if you go back into the list you can see oh yeah uh my necromancer one or actually it was the barb one on the barb one i was this rank or whatever so a lot of people are just like oh that's kind of a bummer like i'll never be able to quite know like where i was or you know what position or what even what uh, class it was back in week one or two. So they they took a little bit of that to heart and decided to create this blog series now where they'll um, sort of put in the Hall of Fame, if you will, the top 50 from the Challenge Rift for whatever week it was. They did a little catch up for the first blog, so they combined weeks one and two, and then just earlier this week was the week three recap. And right now it's only for the Americas, but I think the idea is that it'll expand to do the top 50 for each region. And that's pretty sweet, because now you can okay. you can have an extra incentive to really push for the top of those Challenge Rift leaderboards. Yeah, and there's a, a certain someone that has had a, a, a pretty good showing on all three of those. I'm streaking! Yep. Yeah. So far so good. Hit a top 50 for all three um, the last one I had was a top 10 on the barb one. My best so far is actually the Necromancer one, which is kind of surprising to me because I still don't feel like I have a great grasp of the class in terms of mastery. But I guess Challenge Rifts, I feel like I have a decent mastery of just in terms of how to perfect roots and stuff like that. But I the, think I was ranked kind seven. Kind of more on the, the strategizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like, to me, I feel like I almost have been training for this just from watching speedruns, watching how uh, you know, like a Zelda speedrunner might try to shave a second of a time by taking a certain route or using a certain mechanic in a certain way. It really feels like you apply those things to this because you'll know how Blood Rush works, right? Or you'll know how this enemy is supposed to move, but you're trying to manipulate your Blood Rush skill with the movement of the enemy to have it in the exact spot where if you blow it up, the orbs will stay perfectly centered right there. And now you've just saved like, you know, 0.5 of a second or a second. And it really starts to matter when you're going for the highest of the highest because you know, we haven't seen it quite yet, but eventually there might be a uh, challenge risk where everyone is separated by, you know, how many tenths of seconds or one second. Some mm -hmm. of them have been pretty close, but 
there's always it always seems to be like a person or a person's few persons that just figure out a way to blow it all out of the water it's been an intriguing um few first weeks oh yeah and i have to also give a shout out to a uh, longtime friend of the show mikey yeah mikey's dear, been crushing it dear god the thing is like he missed like the first week but then on the last couple of weeks he's had top five finishes yep is uh, he in the last one in particular i think he was the second second place yeah yeah and this mode was made for him because, you know, he's a person with not a lot of time to grind something like a season, mm -hmm. but he is competitive enough to really want to strive for those high positions. So, you know, this is perfect. You can get in, do like an hour or two of runs and really start to hone in on your uh, your route and your time. And, yeah. you know, you get a whole week to do that. Yeah, and it's something that you can even actually, um, you can get practice, or not so much practice, but you can kind of like lay out your method offline. You know, you don't have to be in the game. Uh, if you can just, like, spend the time to go through, like, map it out, find the elites in the pile hunts and such, and just kind of, like, uh, map out, kind of, like, the, the plot it, uh, plot the route in your head um, in between actually going through playing and making attempts. Very true. And you do these things enough where you will literally be able to sit outside of the rift and just be like, okay, on map two, there's that yellow, and then there's the blue, the blue. If I try to bring the blue to the blue, like, people are like, what are you talking about? But you, mm -hmm. in your head, you can totally you see, see like, it. Yeah, you start, it's like, I don't even see the, the numbers anymore. You see blonde, redhead, brunette. Huh? Movie quote. Yeah. I did it. <laughs> Achievement unlocked. There you go. Uh, but you're right. You, I mean, people have been making, like, I don't see them as much anymore, but during, like, closed beta, people are making maps to sort of plot out, like, this is where the elites are, this is where the pylon is. So you can do things like that to, like you said, mental practice outside of the game and really start to hone in on exactly what you want to do to get the best time. Mm -hmm. Being able to watch video helps a lot, too. I guess we're kind of turning it into a little, like, tips and tricks for challengers. But if you record your runs, it's super helpful because you can see when you activated, like, Land of the Dead, if you were to delay it by three seconds, would it have improved like where you ended up, you know, killing mobs? And if you had enough time to reach the yellow, it'll just show you kind of ways you can um, further improve your thing. Mm -hmm. That's got uh, got a lot of potential there. Hopefully that they go through and it, the, since this is something that you're you're really into, like what do you feel that they could maybe? Um, improve upon maybe not with the the challenge rift the mechanically itself but maybe like in it's like how they put it out there or promote it um i think we're starting to get on the right track with something like this like a blog that's just calling more attention to it because i saw like one of the blogs hit reddit and then people are like oh people actually try like super hard on challenge rifts and so maybe that'll just uh encourage some people to go a little harder and the more people you have concentrating on really good times, then maybe the more popular it gets. Maybe it hits streamers and they do it more. Like there was actually a moment I was watching Shinobi do the Necromancer one, and he was gunning for me, but he didn't even know I was watching. So he was like, <laughs> "Oh, Leviathan! I gotta beat that Leviathan!" <laughs> and I actually clipped him saying that and tweeted about it. So it was kind of like a fun moment. But just more of that, I think, more exposure could definitely help. I was talking to Bagstone, who most people might know as a great contributor to Diablo fans. He runs basically like the d3resource.com site. Mm -hmm. So anytime you've you've uh, looked at the seasonal journey on there or like the comparison of the different difficulties and the desperates and stuff, like he's responsible for stuff like that. So he's, you know, one of the great minds behind organizing data in D3. And he had a great idea in terms of, you know, when we were on closed beta, everyone from different regions was doing the same greater or the same challenge rift. And that was without lag because everyone's on the same server. Mm -hmm. And if you want to challenge someone else to the greater rift, or sorry, I keep saying greater, the challenge rift that's for their uh, server, you might get a disadvantage because, like, let's say Wudijo or someone from EU tries to come over to do the NA one, they're already at a disadvantage because if there's a movement skill that requires precise movement, you know, you're dealing with the MS of, you know, 50 additional uh, MS or something like that. And now you're not going to be able to have as crisp movement. So you're already disadvantaged. If everyone had the same challenge rift across all three regions, then you would for sure know I'm competing against everybody that's that's touched this thing, and I am number one. Mm -hmm. And that's got to feel way better than... I mean, it's nice to be number one on your own server for sure, but just imagine the level, the fierceness of competition. If you're global. Yes. So I think there's just a missed opportunity to be global there. Um, one of the things I was talking back to him about was I think one of the limitations might be that 
these runs are legit runs run by people on those servers, right? So maybe they're taking an America's run for the America's server and maybe they can't import that to EU because that run never existed on EU. You know what I mean? Hmm. It's hard yeah. to know like what the system can and cannot do. Maybe that's uh, a, a yeah. political question. Yeah, that could be. Yeah, because I hadn't even thought about that. Maybe there's some sort of uh, technical limitation about how those things um, are logged, and that it's not just like some sort of format that can just be like recorded and then sent off and here plug this in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it's actually having to go through and pull, extract the data like from the logs itself, and it's not something that can be like just injected. Right. Right, right. It'd be, I would actually, that'd be a fun like lightning talk panel or something. Yeah. How do challenge rifts operate? Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think between those two it would be like interesting places to start to get challenge rifts maybe a little bit more robust. Um, there, there was I, I wish I could remember the Reddit thread in particular because there were a few other ideas that started to crop up there that seemed pretty uh, exciting just from someone who wanted to invest a lot of time and energy into challenge rifts. So I'll, maybe I'll come back for the next show with more prepared talking points there. All right. Let's see. And then I guess we just have the one last topic. Yes, we've been holding off on this one for a while. But yeah, because we, we wanted to talk about this <laughs> one when I was last on the show. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and I know we're, well, we have we're... you here. You're the <laughs> MMO master, in my opinion. At least amongst us. Oh so, god, that bar is set low. <laughs> lead us through some of the thoughts on this, and you know, this is uh, an an idea that we've sort of batted around previously, but it's starting to maybe pick up a little bit more steam now that you know people like Riker are making videos about it and whatnot. Yeah. So the big thing that we're going through and talking about uh, back in early June, uh, Riker recorded a video that talked about uh, the possibility of a like a Diablo two remake. Uh, as well as, what about a Diablo 4 MMO? Um, and this kind of came uh, spurred from some conversations I was having with David Brevik, and we learned that the, the Diablo 3 originally was being designed um, as an MMO. Um, maybe not like a, a complete legit like MMO, but more of just like a, a, a persistent world. Um, and, you know, so that way you could, like, go back to town and interact with, like, hundreds of other people and such. And so it was just a little bit different from, you know, an ARPG. And, like, the ways that they could go through and make it, as well as just going back to more, uh, more of the evidence that shows, like, what that Diablo unannounced project is. Because we saw uh, some... For a while there, since the original, like, job postings uh, back before... Uh, BlizzCon of last year was like the last time that we had saw any job postings for that unannounced project and then they just started reappearing again you know a couple months ago mm -hmm. uh, and like what that might mean and like what uh, maybe where they might go be going with it because some of the things that they're looking for and hiring for and that is a, that is a Pikachu I don't, Hello. Know, I don't know how that he likes MMOs too oh okay um, still waiting for that Pokemon MMO um, oh. but, uh, you know, it's just like how some of the, some of the things that they're specifically looking for and hiring lend themselves more towards an MMO, uh, than like just a straight traditional, uh, ARPG. You know? Yeah. Uh, one of the, one of the things that still kind of bugs me is where is Tom Chilton? And also who's this game director? Like, you know, there are all these big, big things that we had, I guess almost a year ago this point in time yeah uh where we were Man. looking and seeing like the shifting of the guard and postings that were major and we don't have yeah. answers yeah and i mean this is one i believe i talked about this um previously on the show but when i went out for the uh, the necromancer summit that was a question that i had asked and was like uh so who exactly is the the game director for diablo 3 now since the position's been filled and the answer that i got was we we can't say uh why why is the game director for team three a secret you know what yeah. in, in in like there's it's it's like one of those things by not giving an answer you're you're kind of like giving a lot of things away because at that point like if if telling us who the game director is gives away information as to what the 
is currently <laughs> being worked on or like so the future content that they're doing well then that kind of narrows it down doesn't it that 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 well, kind of that kind of at least gives us an idea that there's something big that's going on in the background you can you can start to draw infer some conclusions perhaps right oh yeah i i remember we we kind of looked at that when um <laughs> when Chat. uh oh what it's, it's jay, jay wilson, wilson. <laughs> <laughs> oh he'll be the lead writer now since he's uh he's going back to being oh, yeah. a novelist um there you go. Uh, but where did it where did it go? Sorry. Who's who's the uh the new art director for Diablo three? Oh man, um, oh, man, I feel bad. How can I forget this name? Uh, his print is right up on the wall. I, I know, read. right? It's like I looked over at it, but I can't I can't make out the name from this distance. I want to say it's John something. I'm so bad. I'll I'll pull it up here. Hold on. Hold on, John Mueller. John Mueller. I remember yes. when he was like first like announced, um, like not so much officially announced, but announced because we saw his name on the panel presentation with his title like at BlizzCon. Uh, what was that last October? I think mm -hmm. it was when we went through and saw it, and went and looked up, you know, like his LinkedIn profile and his, you know, his uh, <laughs> his art portfolio that he had online and like the very first thing that he lists as, like, a talent is, like, MMO development. Mm hmm You know, and just, like, little stuff like that. And then also recently, uh, you know, we, we just found out that there's a new senior designer on the team uh, that just uh, went and got hired. And yes, Harrison G. Pink. Yep. And uh, he was uh, now, he was at uh, Telltale Games, uh, beforehand and had experience with uh, making uh, I think it was Mafia 3 was the uh, the game that he had helped uh, that he was a creator on sounds right yeah. uh, so you know and like just some of the things that he had uh, listed like in his um, portfolio let's see where is it uh, one of the things that he has listed as background, responsible for implementing open world combat level design throughout the game, which include uniquely themed background activities, was listed as part of his uh, resume for after Mafia 3. And so, like, this whole open world uh, development and such. So it's like... Sounds like, you know, WoW quest lines or something. Yeah, it doesn't even necessarily have to be, like, a true MMO, but even if it's just more of a, uh, you know, like a... A persistent world you know where you meet up like in a town hub and you see everyone else that's like on your server or your shard or whatever uh and then you can go through and i guess almost kind of like how destiny does it you you run out into the world like you can go through and sit in like one of the social hubs and you have all the people uh going through and running around and when you uh head out into the world it like breaks it out into levels and so when you're running around there might only be like a couple other people in that particular zone with you um, and then as you continue on to other areas, when you get into like kind of like a quest zone, uh, everyone else like disappears and it's just you or anyone else that's in your party. You know, if I'm, I'm going to go through and like, uh, tackle like this dungeon, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm going out into act one and I'm going to go find the pit and there'll be other players that are running around in act one that you'll go and like, uh, run by. And, but then it's just, you know, it's, it's just you and your teammate when you go into the pit and you won't find anybody else. You know, little little tiny things like that that could make more of um, like a, a, a living world for like a Diablo kind of like ARPG MMO t hybrid type thing. Hmm. No, I mean, that seems reasonable. It seems like an interesting marriage of the genre and a way to push it forward without necessarily breaking too much from the uh, traditions of the you know true ARPG experience. Something that you actually kind of triggered in me, and now that I've said triggered, I'm you triggered. are more triggered. <laughs> yeah, because trigger is my trigger word. Goddamn. Um, Destiny. So, you know, it was kind of weird for people to see the integration of Destiny 2 into the Blizzard launcher, which I guess is the name that we're going with, Battle.net Forever. Mm -hmm. um, and I almost wonder if it's a gateway drug, if you will. What if there's something to be said if you're like, you know, maybe it's going to have a Destiny-esque uh, feel to it if they're actually getting players that are blizzard players to play destiny 2 and it's like is you know very far-fetched kind of um, tinfoil hat theory mm -hmm. but 
you get the players who maybe are you know not going to go out and buy a Destiny two or something, but because it's in their launcher, they might try it just yeah. to get an experience with it. And then Blizzard mm-hmm. says, by the way, we have this new Diablo game coming, and then you might feel like it's kind of familiar because for those of you who played this Destiny two thing that we were teamed up with, we pulled a little bit of similarities from there. And so now you transition people back to a Blizzard title, but it has mm-hmm. elements of this other thing that was sort of weirdly tied to Blizzard, and now it's just this happy circle of hey, play this thing, it's now a Blizzard product. Uh, well, I mean, there's already an interconnectivity between Diablo 3 and Destiny already, because um, when Destiny launched, it had a lot of the same issues that Diablo 3 did. Uh, problems with the itemization, the rarity of drops, and finding stuff to like make your uh, builds work, and just kind of like generic loot outside of like those super super rare items that were very difficult to find and you know at that point it was just rare combination on like epic weapons because your exotics weren't all that great until they went and did a couple passes and we later learned from i think it was a jdc talk that uh josh had done where he went and mentioned that it was him and a couple of like the senior designers on the diablo 3 team went up to i think it's uh seattle where bungie is uh headquartered uh, and they went up to the, the Bungie headquarters and worked with the, the Destiny team and they, they brainstormed and they shared a lot of ideas and thoughts that um, Blizzard had made improvements um, in uh, Diablo 3, especially going into Reaper of Souls and like Loot 2.0 that helped the Destiny team uh, make some changes uh, with their right. itemization and loot systems. And so, you know, they, they both are under uh, the uh, Activision Blizzard uh, publishing you know, kind of like a uh, house. And so there is already kind of like that uh, certain level of interactivity that's already been going on there. And now that's only strengthened by Destiny 2 being on the, uh, the Battle.net Blizzard app launcher uh, <laughs> uh, when it comes out here in October. I haven't played uh, the Destiny 2 system, or the Destiny 2 beta, which started yesterday. But um, I, I was a you know pretty big fan of Destiny when it first like, went through and uh, started... Uh, but my inability to like find uh, parties or clans that kind of like worked with my schedule uh, kind of prevented me from doing some of the higher end content, and so I just uh, dropped off in uh, my uh, my you know amount of time that I put into the game. Uh, but that that's one of those ones that it's they they very much were against using the label of MMO for Destiny. They didn't they didn't want that term or that label on it, and it it is kind of uh, it has a lot of other similarities with. Uh, Diablo and the fact that it is more, um, you know, it is it's a shooter kind of like ARPG. Uh, it has smaller groups. Most of the content is done with you know like three people, but then you have the raids, which is uh, six or nine, nine. Uh, I think nine? It's, I think I think it's uh, six. It's two fire teams for raids. Someone in chat, I'm sure, can go through and correct me on that one uh, once they catch up. Uh, but then you also have just like that open world component where you're you're out in like the yeah like kind of like the pseudo adventure mode you're going and you're doing uh, bounties uh, essentially you know out in the open world exploration where eventually uh, if you're out there or there's even websites that track it there's these uh, kind of like uh, public events that uh, you can get some pretty good drops from and such that you know, kind of scales the number of people that are in that particular area. And there's a big announcement. So you might just be out, you know, going and trying to finish up like a set of bounties. And then you get the notification or like the sky turns dark and an eclipse comes out because uh, something like went through and crash landed and you have to go and do this uh, kind of like a massive fight on the other side of the zone, you know. And so there's there's a lot of... Sounds cool. Uh, yeah, no, it is. It's really fun and it's uh, engaging. It's exciting. And that's some things that could be added, you know, into, uh, like, Diablo Next without making it a, a true MMO. Oh. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the people that are reluctant to say, oh, it's going to be an MMO, and, like, the people, like, they wouldn't uh, siphon off, you know, the WoW player base to feed into a, a new MMO. Like, it doesn't necessarily, like you, you're saying, it doesn't have to be a strict by-the-rules MMO. Like, it really could just take some things from that genre while keeping the base of being an ARPG and really just sort of tie it all together in a neat bow. Uh, I think it would be, I guess the next question is, are we interested in a game like that, right? Like, how does that compare to something like just a upgraded D3 to D4, you know, keeping everything the same, but maybe change the itemization, change the base system, et cetera? Yeah. uh, 
I guess that that is the question, and that's something that we just might never know until we get those, <laughs> the, you know, the, those talks when they're they are going through and after the launch of Diablo Four, where they do those like post mortems. That it was at this point in the development of the second expansion for Diablo Three that we realized that in order to make these, uh, we're making such sweeping changes to the itemization and the base core concepts of the game that it it would just be. A better time well spent to make a, a new game and fully deliver on that experience instead of trying to band-aid the old system. Yeah, you know, no. who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, and also just to address like one of those points that you made with you know would they make another MMO to like compete with uh, compete with WoW uh, um, Titan? Yeah, I guess that was going to be the next thing. I'll, yeah, we'll, you know, it's like it's they just they they ended up kind of scrapping it and. The, they never have come out and said it, but all the evidence and a lot of the uh, articles have been published about how the remnants of Titan became Overwatch. You know, the, the engine characters and uh, story and such. That it, it could have just been, you know, they, they were 100% full shotgun ready to go and make a competing MMO with WoW. So I don't think that that is... Um, uh, Something anything that would really be a concern because I think that is also something that like uh, David Brevik talked uh, touched on in one of his uh, conversations with Riker uh, during that uh, multi-part interview where he they didn't really get any pressure from Blizzard um, because they were making Diablo 3 as an MMO alongside the development of WoW and they they weren't right. getting any uh, feedback or pushback you know from uh, Blizzard HQ about well, we don't we don't want another MMO because it's going to compete with World of Warcraft. You know, yeah, that is a good point. They were they were they were behind them in supporting their decision to go through and make the game that they wanted to make. Oh. And that that's also going and continuing to talk about like those uh, David Brevik interviews is, um, you know, he said that they're I'm trying to remember the, kind of like the exact phrasing that he had mentioned but he said that that like arpgs are kind of like at a plateau at the moment and there has to be something like big and exciting some sort of uh big fundamental change in order to like keep the genre alive and to continue to go into the future um but then he also like followed that up with he has no idea what that might be like what that <laughs> evolution for mmos might be because if he did know he'd be making it um and yeah. he's not you know so he uh you definitely uh, wish the uh, Blizzard like the the best of luck in that if they if they manage to go through and find out what exactly that is. And you know who knows maybe maybe kind of like that uh, following kind of I guess like in the the Destiny or the the Guild Wars uh, side of things and making it more of a uh, that I think that might be just what it what it would lend itself towards is that persistent world because you know it's you look at a lot of the things that we have right now like you know the leaderboards even though if it is like an mmo i i don't know how seasons would work or how hardcore would work in general and so that would be <laughs> some big uh fundamental changes uh to some like core tenets of diablo um but well what's you know like there's a lot of things that have like a certain level of permanence that uh, attaches to the game. And it's always one of my uh, biggest issues with uh, just Diablo 3 in general is, you know, I, I can't just go through and say, you know, I'm playing a Necromancer. You know, it's like I, I'm a, I'm a, a Blood Lancer build. I'm, I'm just a Necromancer who's running Blood Lance and tomorrow I'll run Rathmas, you know, and I'll run right. Singularity Rathmas or Thorns Rathmas. That if it kind of goes to like that that uh, MMO or persistent world things, everything kind of like slows down a little bit and s things just by nature gain a little bit more level of permanence. It might create a bit more of that identity that you have with whatever it is that you're playing. Yeah, it definitely is one way to recapture that, which is, you know, one of the maybe stronger criticisms was a lot of people felt that they just didn't have the customization for D3 that they wanted to have. Mm -hmm. The RPG elements were as strong, right? So yeah. if you go with this blended genre or this redefining of the ARPG, maybe part of that is just a stronger connection to your characters. Yeah, and that that also is just kind of come down to you know personal taste and uh, preferences. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, because uh, David uh, was a, he's a huge fan, still is a huge fan. Like every, any ARPG game that he makes is going to have a talent tree. He just, he loves talent trees. He absolutely thinks that they're like a, a core tenet of uh, ARPGs. And so there's, there's a lot of different philosophies on what actually makes an ARPG. Uh, the, if you haven't checked them out, uh, you should definitely go to Riker's YouTube channel and go and see like the, the full series. I think it's five or six videos of uh, interviews yeah. that he has with uh, David Brevik, and it's a lot of uh, insight and kind of like calls into question. This is something that we've talked about on the show in the past about what what is an ARPG? What what makes it an ARPG? What is it that like draws us into this particular style of game, or that draws us to Diablo in particular, as opposed to uh, you know, well, we we've received like feedback from a lot of people in chat and people that have emailed in that people like do like. Um, Kind of like the the more complicated system in Path of Exile, you know, if it's kind of a sphere grid system, or you know, maybe uh, people like more of a traditional style or traditional Diablo style game like Torchlight, you know, with the talent trees and such. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just. I hope we'll start to see more and more. Hopefully, not having to read the tea leaves of high rings and things, but like actual, you know, concrete stuff. It probably is still quite a ways off, but oh, we're, yeah. we're here for it. Right yeah, and the, the, to to go through and like as we're going and making like trying to predict the future on this one, everything I'm talking about about this stuff that would be like in the development for this Diablo Four, Diablo Next, um, is not going to be talked about at BlizzCon. Yeah, we we we've talked about this, um, and it's it's years away. You know, like any anything with, with them just going through and hiring for this unannounced project last year, it, it's we're years away from any type of announcement. And the only thing that I could potentially see coming from this year's BlizzCon is uh, a new class. Um, if they, Oh, that was actually something that I wanted to talk about. Um, and you missed it because you didn't watch Brandy's stream yesterday. And I completely forgot about it. But that was something that they mentioned on the geek and sundry, uh, that, the Necromancer uh, was very much something that they wanted to do for part of the 20th anniversary of Diablo, even though it hasn't really been connected or advertised as such. That mm -hmm. The development team really felt that the Necromancer is probably one of the most iconic things, uh, one of the most iconic classes from Diablo, uh, the series as a whole, and they felt its, introdu its reintroduction into Diablo 3 would be a great way of helping to continue to celebrate that 20th anniversary. Uh, for the Diablo series, and that actually made me kind of think uh, if, like, the introduction of a new class, because that was what they answered, like, why the Necromancer and why now? And they said it was like, oh, well, it's because it's the 20th anniversary, and we felt that was a really great, like, tie-in for adding in such a you know, iconic class. And that made me now question that we, we, we might not see a new class announcement at BlizzCon. I don't know. It definitely is still something on the table, and that would be the the upper limit of uh, upper limit of my expectations uh, for any type of announcement at BlizzCon. But the just yeah. the way they phrased it uh, really made me wonder because if they're they they made a new class as like a celebration of the twenty years of Diablo, then does that mean that since there's not really anything to celebrate next year, would they not do something like that? I mean, you could argue that. But you could also take it another way and say maybe it was the um, impetus to go forward with that sort of idea. And, you know, maybe at the time of proposal, it takes some of the risk out of it because you're saying, well, we can tie it to this concrete thing. Like there is this anniversary. People are going to get hyped for it and have the nostalgia and buy into this whole idea of the Necro. And because they were able, you know, whether it's tied to the anniversary or not, because they were able to put it together, package it, sell it if they prove that that is a model that now works for Diablo 3 in terms of adding content, then maybe it opens the door to doing it without having to have it tied to anything. You know what I mean? So maybe it was mm -hmm. the perfect storm to get an idea like that out there, and now they can run with it because they've proven they can do it. Yeah, there, there definitely is that, that point. And I know it's something that I've mentioned before that, I guess it would largely that whether they do another class would be largely dependent upon how successful the necromancer is or isn't, and that anything that they do past the necromancer because it doesn't have revive would be a lot easier to do, <laughs> or even just the fact that it doesn't have corpses, so they have to like completely redesign, uh, like kind of like that resource system or structure, uh, for this next class. 
That that would also be easier to do. Bro, you're uh, forgetting about the fact that they're going to do the Angel Demon Hybrid class that allows you to do every skill that exists in the game at once. And they have to get this once. animation down. Yeah. Yes. That it wipes out the entire Greater Rift. We'll be doing Greater Rift 200s. Yep. It just, it is a, uh, it's a 25 minute cooldown on the skill. <laughs> And when you level it, and when you go into the rift, it starts on cooldown, so you just have to stack cooldown reduction. Oh and so God. it's the number of times that you can, you know, get procs on your Obzod. It will be the one that determines how fast of a clear you can get. Oh, man, that sounds like really engaging gameplay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the I win button. Oh, um, man. But I yeah. earned it, though. Yeah. Uh, Love it. Yeah, it just it's one of those things that's just like it's that that was just like the big thing that kind of like caught my attention because sure. it, it it's mainly because it's weird that they would be mentioning that now after the release of the necromancer and not prior. You know, cuz it, it we the, the question has been asked many times before why the necromancer and why now? And it was just like, well, we, well we, you know, we or they guess that they they kind of controlled that question before because they would always pre uh, um, preface it with the uh, you know, why why not another expansion why just why just a class and not an expansion mm. and you know it's like oh because it would take a couple of years to make an expansion and so we figured that we could do a class uh, sooner and then now it's kind of like oh well yeah the the necromancer was part of the the 20th anniversary you know that that's why we did that new class is almost if they're kind of setting up a, a narrative as to maybe not have a new or class announcement yeah, yeah at the the new that uh blizzcon have very well could be yep i hope you're wrong <laughs> oh i want to be wrong yeah. on this one i want to play druid amazon angel demon i win button hybrid <laughs> um yeah but uh i don't know there's just it's something to keep in mind yeah something to keep in mind and that would also kind of like go into we would be uh Beginning to enter in, we'd be getting close to entering into the second year of development for this uh, unannounced project. The full, the first full year after having like a game director and the full uh, kind of uh, senior staff plucking away at it and working on stuff. It does beg the question, you know, where is Wyatt? <laughs> yeah. Because we haven't seen him in any of the Necro production stuff. I... It's been Julian, it's been uh, Travis... Yep, I, I will say that I got a little... I was happy at first when I saw um, Harrison go through and tweet yesterday about joining the Diablo 3 team. You know, how he even went through and you know uh, tweeted at him, welcome to the community. Um, awesome. Uh, it's going to be awesome to go through and see what, uh, what he will add to the table, and I hope to have uh, talks with him at BlizzCon. Uh, but uh, the next... Exactly the next thing that I did at that point was I went and checked uh, Wyatt's Twitter account to make sure that it still was tagged as senior game designer for uh, Diablo 3 because that's the title that Harrison just got. They do have oh. they do have multiple senior designers, but it's just like one of those things that it got me a little bit scared just because Wyatt has been uh, flying under the radar recently. I just wanted to make sure that he hadn't, um, uh, you know, like transferred teams or something like that, kind of like what happened um, with uh, John Yang and Don Vu. Right. Um, although they were they were associate designers, not senior designers, but um, just because you know, where where it wouldn't wouldn't be story time without Wyatt. It just, it just wouldn't. <laughs> well, he did pass the reins a little bit last. He time. did. He did. Yeah. Um, so hopefully it wasn't foreshadowing. No? Uh, God, because that fear was in my head, <laughs> mm -hmm. even all the way back at BlizzCon. It's like I hope. It's like because I, I, I tweet. I think I made that tweet. You know, it's like story time just evolved when uh, Joe got up and was doing the, uh, the the story time last year. And in the back of my head, I was thinking, I hope he's not passing the torch. <laughs> you know, he's just inviting another person to the campfire, not you know, like passing the torch along. So, uh, don't know. Don't it's know. It's to be seen. Yep. Yeah. We need to. We need to start. You need to start a new uh, hashtag campaign. Where's Wyatt? <laughs> I'm down. I like yep. it. All right. <sighs> so I think that I think that's good for us for today. We got all the news things out of the way. We're I... rhyming. <laughs> Completely intentional. Yep. Yep. Well, so I guess 
we we do have um, a couple of things to go through and show here mm -hmm. uh, as we transition transition in, into our items of the week. No emails, guys. I want to hear you... from you next episode, uh, season eleven. I, I'm I'm gonna go through and just take it as people people are going through having fun with the necromancer and or taking a break from Diablo mm -hmm. because we had such a long downtime in between. I can see uh, it. Yeah. Uh, but our uh, our first uh, email, this one comes in from Nick. Uh, specifically, Leviathan wanted to show you his dainties pinding that he went through and got here. And then this, uh, this bad boy primal uh, clocks in with 650 intelligence, 650 vitality, 15% extra life, and has been rerolled for 516 armor. Secondary property of 210 physical resistance, and the maxed out, you gain an additional 50% damage reduction when there is an enemy afflicted by your decrepify curse. I think I had made a call on the last episode for your necromancer items, your primals, so... Goddamn. <laughs> this guy mm -hmm. answered the call, because that's perfect. Like, you're like, where's the all res? But remember, it's an int class, so again, armor is... Yep. Mucho grande. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and of course, resistance. it's got physical resistance, so if you're running esoteric, that's... You know, physical resistance is, you know, one of the uh, the better ones to get to continue to stack up there. That's beautiful. And then uh, our last minute edition here, we've got a primal witching hour sent in by no one. Not <laughs> sure who has sent it in, um, but this one, <laughs> sorry, uh, not sorry. This one, this one uh, comes in at 650 dexterity, 650 vitality, increases attack speed by 7%, critical hit damage by 50, 210 arcane resistance, and increases health and uh, uh, health and gold pickup radius by two yards. And has been augmented with a rank 104 gem for an extra 520 dexterity. This is what we like to call the Lawn LTK Monk's Dream. So good. Oh yes. So so good. I oh, believe yes. that's what she had that for from season ten. A little relic of that. And what what a beautiful thing indeed. I'm still mad at her too because she like doesn't either she doesn't like or doesn't uh, prioritize solo push. So she easily could have taken a top three spot with how good like I want to say her lawn LTK monk had like ten out of thirteen pieces primal. And she just, like, refused to push it to its limit. So it never saw its full potential. And I'm mad at her because the competitive person in me was like, well, fuck, give me that then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm taking that to rank one. Oh, it was so amazing. Just the drops after drops. But, yeah, that's a nice piece. Oh, yeah. Even my uh, my UE Demon Hunter would like to find something like that tomorrow. Yeah, and, uh, well... I, I had this I had this queued up for when we were going through and talking about it, but we kind of like skipped it over. I just want to go through and show it anyways. Um, just for those uh, that are watching on stream or catching this on YouTube, uh, this is Riker's uh, tier uh, list. Uh, oh, yes. This this is as of now. We kind of mentioned it a little bit uh, earlier, but kind of the conversation just didn't feel like a good time to go through and uh, put it up. But this is uh, Riker's breakdown of his uh, tier list of like the top builds for all of the classes combined. Um, and as you can go through and see, that Triangle's Corpse Lance, that Blood Lance build, is, that is the, the S tier. That is the best solo GR. Uh, currently, end of all, all time. Yep. And that, of course, displaced the, uh, the Lightning Archon Wizard. Yeah, well, we have like the uh, the Lawn Spirit Barrage, which kind of like came up in the middle of the last season. So the, since the last time that he did uh, the uh, the tier rankings, I think at the beginning of season ten was the last time that he did uh, one of these. Sounds right. Yeah, and so he's done this one. He'll probably do another one, you know, a couple of weeks into uh, season eleven, just to kind of give like that updates. Uh, but just you know, so that way you have an idea of uh, where he you might want to look for your particular build on whichever class that it is that you want to play. You can see that there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a pretty, a pretty decent spread between all of the classes up there. Not, not counting, of course, that Bloodlance build, but if you look at the, uh, all of the other traditional classes, they pretty much all have some sort of representation. Um, 
uh, up there, with at least being able, there's not that big of a difference between like the tier A and uh, tier B, and I think the only one that doesn't is the Barbarian. Yeah. That has to drop down to, to tier C before they have um, anything that's there. Yeah, the, the uh, Wrath of the Waste stuff has been pushed a little bit, but still just a little off of mm -hmm. uh, what some of the other classes are doing. Yep. That's a good good mix of diversity. Well, yeah. That grows, man. Just come in and take the top spot. Yep. So, you've got anything else that you want to go through and talk about before we head to the outro? I mean, I'm excited for season 11, of course. I really, I just, I love the idea that there is undiscovered territory out there. Like, I am not fully convinced. We just looked at that tier list, and I'm not fully convinced that the clear, full picture is there. Like, when you said, uh, you know, Riker will have to, or likely will reapproach that in the middle of the season, I bet it'll look a little different. Like, we'll probably mm -hmm. see some other necro stuff crop up or... You know, maybe or maybe even not, because maybe now someone sees this and they're like, oh, well, the the idea here is to go with whatever is the best and there won't be as much innovation since seasons don't really allow for a ton of innovation, you know? Yeah. In such I, a limited amount of time. I, I noticed that there's not a lot of, um, like, especially like we can just look at last season in the, uh, the Law and Spirit Barrage. You know, that, that came up, what, a month and a half? Like literally almost halfway through the season halfway, before yeah, yeah before that started going through and getting popular you don't really see because there's the, there's the initial push um, to try and um, get on as much of like that hype and that that high level energy at the beginning of the season um, so people are just gonna go with what they know they're gonna go with what's easy what's already been um, what's already been kind of like theory crafted out there they're gonna go with what's already kind of like guaranteed to be a good set or a good build uh, mm -hmm. and then once we hit the mid-season lull is when we start seeing some experimentation. I've got a really great set of gear. I've got some... Uh, I'm starting to get to the point where I want to do some higher level augments. Um, I've got really good level gyms. You know, I'm you know in the... the thou I'm in past Paragon 1000 and what have you. Now I can actually take some time to experiment a little bit. Um, and then that's, that's when we start seeing some of that theory crafting coming out. So, yeah. Have to kind of have to wait and see, and of course there'll, there'll be those people that aren't playing season uh, that might push some stuff on the eras. That's a good point. Good point. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to see. So yeah, that's uh, you know my closing comments. Just I'm excited for season eleven. Can't wait to start. Going to be a sick, sick weekend coming up, and looking forward to coming back to the show and talking about all the travails. Hopefully, I'll come back with some rank ones for the conquests. Here's hoping. Here's yeah. hoping. Uh, but with that, we'll be going through and pulling this episode to a close. Um, so if you want to go through and send, uh, send us feedback or have your, uh, your item of the, the week shown here on the show, please uh, don't be afraid to drop us a line. Westmarch Workshop at blizzpro.com is the email address uh, for those that want to uh, go and uh, submit things to the show. And again, that is, again, Westmarch Workshop at blizzpro.com. Uh, we're also on Twitter. We're at the WM Workshop. You can, of course, always find us uh, live on twitch.tv slash blizzpro. We stream every other Wednesday night at uh, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, or 6 p.m. Blizzard uh, time, <laughs> as we went through and claimed it. And you can find most of the topics that we talked about and more over at uh, diablo.blizzpro.com. We are even in-game. We are the Blizzpro clan, uh, and we're pretty full yeah extremely full and uh if it is anything like what happened last season uh we'll probably be full for most of the season so uh, getting spots in will be kind of harsh and limited uh but we do have the west marsh workshop community uh so that way you can at least still go through hang out and chat with us or you can even uh come and uh hop into uh discord uh discord.gg slash blizzpro um I know that you have your own uh, Discord server. I don't know whether you're going to be splitting your time in between uh, Leviathan's Lair or the uh, the uh, uh, BlizzPro Discord, but I'll probably be hanging out tomorrow night uh, over there for anyone that wants to come in and chat. Um, or if you happen to be leveling hardcore, maybe grab some games later on into the evening. Nice. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try to probably split half and half, but uh, I'll definitely be around. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about. Uh, and then, of course, you can go through and follow us individually. Um, at uh, I am at Nineball Gamer on Twitter and Twitch.tv slash Nineball. 
And then, of course, my wonderful co-host over here that held down the show last week. Uh, you can find at LeviathanD3 on Twitter and at twitch.tv slash Leviathan111. Um, and, of course, you don't want to forget uh, the uh, twitch.tv slash BlizzPro, where we go through and have the Westmarch Workshop. Uh, as I already mentioned, we stream every other Wednesday night. But while you're here, if you like the content that we do, please uh, feel free to go through and check out all the other great shows uh, that we have to offer. If you are a fan of Blizzard titles, we have got you covered. Monday nights um, is Well Met, our Hearthstone podcast. Tuesday nights is the Heroes Power Hour. And Thursday nights is the, uh, the Payload uh, our Overwatch podcast. So please go through, give us a like. Uh, and if you want to uh, help uh, support our show or any of the other shows that we do, we do have that wonderful little uh, subscribe button up there at the top that does, uh, of course, help uh, pay for you know the uh, hosting of the, uh, the show and such. So uh, with that, I will uh, open the floor to you, good sir, if you have any other thing to add to the outro. Can you... Any last minute inappropriate dick jokes? Uh, nice dick. Nice. Okay. Well, um, yeah, we'll we'll end on that one. We'll end on nice dick. <laughs>